Okay, so that was one of the most high value sessions for anyone that's buying a property right now. Um, unreal. We just had Scott Agate of Hallow House, and this is what we went through. So we've got the five must haves as a buyer that you need to have before you go out there and start trying to purchase a property. Um, analyzing, how to analyze a property to make sure that you're not overpaying, that you're coming with a walkaway price that is realistic and not going absolutely gangbusters and mental price wise. But my absolute favorite, someone who buys properties day in and day out, um, I love the scripts. What are those little one to two percenters that you can get an advantage over real estate agents and to secure that best deal? So what have we got here? We've got how to buy pre-auction, how to deal in a multi-offer situation, how to actually make sure that we're the ones that are securing the deal other than the other interested parties. And then what happens when it's just you and the vendor? You've got the best offer and the vendor's coming back and putting pressure on you. What are the scripts to cut that out entirely? Um, how to be the one to get the last shot and how to buy pre-auction. How do I actually secure this deal before it goes to the auction and get it done? So this session was with Scott Agat of Hello House. He is an absolute legend in the property negotiation space. So you're going to absolutely love it. Um, but uh, we also have a giveaway at the end. There's 20 slots available. Two zero, um, and maybe there's some still slots, uh, still some slots left for the YouTube audience. So check it out. Pop some comments below because we are trying to work out what's the best way to, you know, word out this session so that we can give you guys the best scripts and dialogues that you can take out there um, in your investing. So good luck with it. We'll catch you in there. And we are live on Oz Property Investors. We bring the big names and we have the big fun. How are you going, Mr. Scott Agard? Hello, House. What's happening? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really good. I'm I'm sweating bullets on the Gold Coast, and I'm ready to share some of my you know juicy tips. Let's do it. <laughs> I thought you nearly said something else. There. Juicy no, tips. No idea. Anyway. Your yeah. mind raced no, away. That... Yeah, <laughs> like a bad man. No, you're, you're not nervous about coming on the okay. show. Like I would have thought, like bringing we, we induce panic and fear just to make sure people are bringing the value. So uh, it's going to be you're absolutely a pro at this. So I'm excited to we're going to be talking about how to get those off market deals, how to secure them because we're talking pre show. It is bloody incredibly hard out there. So this session is going to be invaluable for the people. We're going to be talking about a couple of different scripts and scenarios about how to sort of buy pre-auction and the sort of the exact sort of wording to, wording to say and, and the sort of way to play it. I'm going to be talking about multi-office sort of scenarios and bid, avoiding bidding against yourself. So heaps of value, heaps of content. So I'm this is going to be a, a fun and an amazing session. So let's go, awesome. shall we, Joe? I'm pumped. I'm pumped. Who's this I'm guest that's got all the juice? Yeah, who's this guy with all the who's this guy with all that knowledge? No, this is gonna be a good one. It literally the biggest thing right now is the market is so hot and so difficult to get into that every single little one percent that you can take advantage of, um, you should be. And one of the biggest things that I'm seeing out there in the market is people not knowing what to say when to say it, how the process works, how do I get access to off-market deals? What happens when the agent doesn't give me the price? How do I get the best deal? What happens when I'm in an auction situation, but I want to buy it beforehand? How do I do all of that stuff? Um, so yeah, let's let's dive in. Um, I'm going to open up with the first question, Scotty Agate. We're going to go straight into it. I'm nervous now, how... Jeff. I'm really nervous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've taken it. Usually Jeff comes in the first, but how do we get off-market deals? This elusive oh God, thing out there. Straight to the gold. Yeah, I mean, I was going to let the viewers wait an hour and 45 minutes before I drop that banger. Speaking of, actually, before we jump into that, we do have a little uh, special treat for you guys. Um, there is a, is it 20 free giveaways that we're giving of uh, Scotty's course? Um, but yep. based on the YouTube algorithm, apparently we have to keep you on right to the end if you want access to that. So... I don't make the rules. Scotty, off markets, why are they Go. so valuable and how the hell do I get them? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess it's probably a super buzzy word in the buyer's agent space. And it's certainly um, a key thing for investors right across Australia that you listen to any podcast, anything you read. There's heaps of talk around off market, pre market. How do we find them? Are they any good? Do you have to overpay to get them? Um, yeah. You know, there's so many different angles and takes on this. And of course, everything de depends on the individual circumstances, how hard your buyer brief is, how realistic you are about price, 
how much work you're prepared to put into it to find those opportunities. And that's what we'll unpack tonight. And I'll give you my little cheat sheet of what we do for all of our um, buyers that we work with. And, and that has, I believe, tremendous results. So that's something that everyone can take away that's tangible from this call tonight. Um, but yeah, it's, it's high value if you can do it. Um, I think it's got the ability if you find the right properties to obviously give you more choice, which is um, gold. Mm -hmm. If you've got greater vision on the market and you've got um, more selection, more choice is, is really important for everybody to find the right asset. Um, and sooner, it's going to obviously reduce your days on market if you can find things like that by reducing your buy competition that you've got to compete against. So that means there's less emotional end users that are involved that potentially put the price up. And my one that's probably the favorite out of all these is that you tend to find motivated sellers and motivated sellers is where we can turn the eh, 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 screw and try and get a better price. That's what it's all about. <laughs> get, the <best laughs> deal. Deal. get the best price, get the best deal. Yeah. So let's unpack what we do and what we coach all of our clients to do to find these properties. Um, because there's, it, it really isn't kind of a wanky sales trick. It's born out of, um, you know, repetition, doing this thousands of times. Um, it doesn't always work. That's the first thing I think is really important to say because you see so many people come out and say off-market is the absolute gold. It no. can be, um, but it depends where you're searching and what the, the, the buyer depth is and, and again, what, you know, how realistic and what your, your buyer brief really is. So it's not always a solution, but if you can go to bed at night, this is what I tell our customers now, buyers that we work with, if we can get you to go to sleep at night knowing that you've defined what you're looking for clearly and you've been honest with yourself, you've really got laser focused in terms of the location that you're looking in and then you're talking to more people in the market than anyone else, you really can't do any more. Okay, so you can go to bed and relax and there's a little bit of luck involved now that what happens after that is just going to be how hard these agents are working behind the scenes to help your cause. So it's about being upfront and um, straight to the point, I think, with what you're looking for. Cut the fluff out and we'll get into that and what that means. Um, yeah, and get to the juicy bits. Get to the good stuff, and boys. That's where the gold is. I just want to unpack what... Um, so we spoke about buying seven times faster than the market. What, what does that actually... Define what that means because I think it's a great title, but I wanted to sort of understand how do you measure that metric? That was a total lie. I don't know, Jeff. I think Joe made that up. I pretty think seven times. Oh, maybe hell, like... Threw me under the bus, Scott. Yeah. It was, on the, it was, <laughs> it was on a good poster, poster, though. Whoever made the poster, I think, thank, <laughs> thank AI for that. No, you've got go, some numbers and statistics behind it. They're, this is actually yeah. how you buy seven times faster, apparently. Yep. So the stats that we looked at through the mortgage industry and through the MFAA and, and, and sort of a lot of digging around all of the statistics that they had over the last six years or so that we've been in business at Hollow House, um, it looks to us that the stats lay out that it takes the average Australian purchaser about seven months to transact a property. So it's a long time. In that period, they're going to spend 90 plus hours of their time looking at 300 plus properties online or in the flesh. Um, the average Australian consumer misses five separate offers before they tend to settle on property six through buyer fatigue. And that's leading to up to 45% of Australians reporting to have buyer remorse through overpaying or compromising on the asset they initially set out to buy or a combination of the two. So that's the, the mm. mortgage industry. That's not mine. Um, what we take from that when I sort of built Hollow House was to look at that and say, okay, how do I, how would I buy as a professional buyer that can have the biggest impact mm. on reducing the days on market and reducing the 90 plus hours that you're going to put into this, this cycle. Um, and reducing and, how much you pay as well, because I think that yeah. that's another, like, it's not just faster. It's also, I, I would say better because you're, you're not sort of overpaying. You, you pay what the price you feel you should be. So yeah, go on with that. Absolutely. Yep, yep. So look, the, so to answer the question then in terms of the seven times faster, seven months is the average. Um, our average is 28 days from a standing start that our, our clients transact in. And before anyone kind of jumps to um, conclusions about it's it's you know harder than that in Perth or it's harder than that in Townsville or Ipswich or Toowoomba, that is across the nation for us at any price point, um, buying any asset type, the average for us is 28 days. So, you know, we have got some really good examples. Um, I had one we had a new client that came on and they did an onboarding call with us at four o'clock on Friday afternoon. They'd been looking for eight months in Perth, in the northern suburbs of Perth. We bought for them at 11 o'clock on Monday morning. So they were less than two business days and uh, we bought at $15,000 below the target price that they set us and our analysis at 850. So, you know, people in Perth or looking in Perth, um, you know, should take heed, I think, and, and, you know, have a look at what they're doing and whether or not um, they can change things up and maybe do it how a professional does to see if it can impact on um, their buying journey positively. But we can get into the nuts and bolts of it. 
Yeah, and and it's important to know as well, like uh, when you're when you're dealing with different um, agents, that that you've got to build re- like you you can't just go in cold and expect to get all of the best deals. Like it does take time to build relationships with these people. So I guess obviously using your services, you kind of cut to the cut to the chase and and cut. You have all the scripts and things like that, which we're going to kind of cover off. But um, if you if you do this stuff. You know, if you put a full time effort into it, you you can do all this stuff. And I guess that's kind of what we're trying to get through tonight is the education side of things. Once you have the education, you can go out there and, and make it happen um, mm-hmm. and get get those deals. And off markets are definitely not the be all and end all. What I'm seeing a lot, so I'm on a lot of you know agent mailing lists that we go through, is that agents are putting on a premium. They're they're listing it off market and they're putting a premium price on it to hopefully snag some idiot who's like, great, I got an off market deal. And I hear this all the time in the buyer's agent space. Like, you know, we secured you know ninety percent of our deals are off market. Really? Are they all going to be the best deals? Is that is that is off market the absolute best place to get deals? Not necessarily. There are some deals on market now. Perth, for instance, I'm I'm not buying anything on market in Perth because everything is now getting sold pre-market and then the agents are just listing the property as sold. So if you go to the real estate and you see sold, 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 under offer, under offer, and you're like, wait, it was only listed an hour ago, it's because they've already sold it off market and then they're kind of listing. So, yeah. Um, Except the one that we saw on Saturday and bought on Monday for this person on realestate.com. But other than that one, I totally agree. Except that one. We can have a whole chat about Perth, but we won't because yeah. we, we talk no, about no, every no. session. Really but, um, no, I, I want to understand. I don't, I'm not sure where you Hang want Hang on. To someone said, did I get the, the haircut memo? Is this, did I, should I have got a haircut or should I be looking like <laughs> Joe and, and Jeff? No, it's all right. You, you're mixing it up. Sure. You're doing things differently, Scott, okay. which is the way it should be done. Sometimes you've got to do it differently. So for me, I want to understand, we've, we've sort of teased a lot. How do you actually, what are, what are some of the ways you can secure these or get these off markets in your inbox or on your phone? What, what are some of those ways? Okay, well, let's start with what sort of happens for most buyers. I, I talk to kind of 10 new buyers a day normally that, mm-hmm. that are coming into the marketplace right across, as I say, nationwide, all different price points. There's a couple of themes and patterns that happens with most buyers that have been looking for, I'd say, north of eight weeks. And I, I really think that if you study a market hard and you're active in that market, you shouldn't be in the market for much more than eight weeks in total. That's from a standing start, okay? And I think that for most people across most assets, unless you're trying to buy an acreage or a penthouse or a garden apartment or something that's that's a bit specific in a certain location, and that can definitely be more challenging to find the right property. So the two key things that I think buyers make a mistake with, and this is, I think, important to lead into this off-market and certainly to address Joey's point just then about um, agents pricing these things high, is that mm-hmm. buyers make the mistake of um, coming to a conclusion of a fair price to pay for a property based on the agent's marketing price or a guide price or a list price, like Joey's just said just then. So that's the number one mistake they make. So they either overpay or they undercook it based on, on whether they think their perception of prices and they miss those properties and that adds to the days on market. And so that's, that's one issue, I think. The other thing is um, they go in and they think that they're doing something unique or special when they're not. And that is going to talk to agents at open homes or going on their database when on average an Australian real estate agent meets about 200 new buyers a week, okay? So when they're meeting that many people through all their open for inspections or all their inquiries, wow. phone, SMS, email, it, the numbers are staggering. You know, it's not unusual for us. I know we don't want to talk about Perth all night, um, but uh, it's not unusual for some of our clients to say, I went to an open home in Perth on the first Saturday and there was 100 people at the open for inspection, right? So there's some crazy numbers. So everybody is doing the same thing. They're walking in and saying, do you have anything off market or pre-market? Um, and mm-hmm. can I go on your database? And they're getting spammed with their email newsletter, spammed with their bullshit properties that don't fit the brief, spammed with all their sold properties that are no interest to them. And they're not getting really any pre or off market opportunities unless they're the ones that are going out in the newsletter like Joe just suggested, which are just baited to sell off market quickly if some donut's going to pay some overinflated price. So that's really the issue is you've got to get it through to yourself. And this is what leads into what we're going to coach. That by doing those steps, you're not special, you're no different to everyone else, and you're not going to get these opportunities. So at the heart of it, if I put my agent hat back on, um, the only buyers that I'm going to work with, because I've got a full dance card every Saturday. I might have six, seven open for inspections, which means auction campaigns, vendors to manage, 200 buyers a week to discuss properties with. I don't have time to service all the people that are unqualified. So I'm going to cherry pick 
the people that are in front of me to do deals. So I'm going to sell those negotiations during the week. I'm going to close my auctions on Saturday. And all of my underbidders from both of those outcomes, I'm going to go and match up with my database to increase my take-home pay. That's how it works. They'll always be pre and off market because the agents are driving that to earn more money. Okay, So they're going to cherry pick those buyers. What I'm going to show you now is to how to get on that cherry pick list without becoming one of those people that's got to miss up to five times to go through this process to get in front of these people to show them that you're a real qualified buyer. So it's a simple Excuse free you. thing that everyone can okay. go and do. Um, and the goal is to get on the list of all of the agents that service those local areas and be taken seriously so it can create deal flow. Um, you can build rapport with those agents and it's a way to consistently stay in contact with them ongoing until you buy a property. But there's a couple of key things that are gonna come out of this. Simplicity, honesty, um, consistency, you know, you've got to be, and responsiveness, um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, really crystal clear communication. So it's not just go and take this and, and deploy it once. It's really understanding why this system works. <clears throat> um, yeah. And it's super simple. Uh, and it sounds too simple to be true, but it's not. And as I said to you, just well, make sure that anyone listening, it's not a silver bullet. There's no guarantee to anything in property. But if you do this, at least you know that you've done everything you can whilst you're also watching realestate.com or domain because 60 to 80% of property is going to sell in that method, whether you like it or not. Up to 40% is going to sell pre or off market. So you have to have a strategy to do both at the same time. Okay. Ooh. I'm excited to hear this. Um, before we yeah, do that, you've, well. jump in. <laughs> you've pumped it. So let's get, let's get into yeah. it after this. Cool. There's nothing worse than going into a situation unprepared, especially when that situation is purchasing one of the most expensive assets of your life against a trained property expert in the form of a real estate agent. It's a scary thought, but it is a skill that can be taught. Do you want to learn how to become fully prepared when buying a property so you can get out there, buy your dream home or investment property without the fear of actually messing it up? Scott Agate, the founder and expert property negotiator at Hello House has been helping people buy their properties by stepping in and negotiating with the agents and saving his clients tens of thousands and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars. Scott has now decided to share all that he's learned over the past 28 years in real estate so you can go out there and do the exact same thing on how to find a property, analyze that property, negotiate on that property and transact on it to get the best results. He's created the Get Buyer Ready course, which is a step-by-step -step guide on how you too can become an expert property negotiator. It's the easy way of how you can avoid all of these agent games and get the best purchase price on that dream home or your investment property. The course is in short bites for busy people with no fluff at all. Just all the information you need to get buyer ready and secure that next property with confidence at the best price. Scott has been kind enough to give our community a massive discount with the link below. Sign up today before you even think about putting an offer on that next property and it will be one of the best decisions you ever make. There you go. What a lead up. And nice. for those that weren't joined in before, we are giving away 20, I think, 20 slots of that course um, potentially for free. I don't know. We need to see it at the end of the show, apparently, and, and find out what the go is and how it all works. Um, so, Scotty Agate, talk us through the, how we get these off-market deals and how we make it a little bit easier for ourselves as buyers. All right, just checking. I am getting paid for all these tips I'm about to give away, aren't they, from 30 years of experience? You guys are paying me, right? You did say that. Uh, yeah, we'll pay you in free courses that we give yeah. away. Uh, to okay, cool. <laughs> Jeff said something about an African uncle, and I wasn't sure what he meant. Yeah. All, 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 all the time, wasn't he? All the Down the rabbit hole with him. <laughs> all good. All right, well, let's jump into it. So at, at the very simplest, this is what we're looking to achieve. We want to get you to clearly define your five absolute non-negotiable points. So if we start with mine, just as a guide, mine's going to be, now I'm on the sunny Gold Coast. Mermaid Beach, east of the easement, this is very important, north Ooh. to rear garden, knockdown, mm -hmm. two million bucks. Okay. Now, any agent worth their salt in Mermaid Beach knows exactly where that is and exactly what type of asset that is. Knockdown, east of the easement. So I've defined my location, laser focused down to a certain level of streets, like a grid streets close to the beach. Okay. That's very specific. But what that's going to mean is that I now can relax that. The only properties that clients are going to send me or agents are going to send me is going to meet that very specific brief because if they send me something that's not going to be that, I'm not even going to look at it, right? So I don't have to stress. They know exactly what I want. There's no gray area. So the goal is to get everybody to be on the same page with what their five most important things are. And 
the biggest challenge that I have with buyers is that they don't really think through their answers. They rush through to say, well, I want a three bed and it has to have two bathrooms and it's got to have two car parking and I want a pool and it's got to be a minimum 600 square metres. Okay, all right. Well, where? Because you need the location, right? Yep. And then, no, well, you let, where to start off with? Yeah. And then it's, well, okay, you said three bed, two bath. Um, would you accept three bed, one bath if it was absolute perfect property in the right price range in your right location? Oh, yeah, we do that. Okay, well, that's not your absolute non-negotiable, right? So we have to keep going through mm. each of those steps to clearly define what it is as a minimum that you would look at because you want to see as much deal flow as possible and then you choose which ones obviously that you're interested in buying or not but you want to get those opportunities because you may trade off some things you may have to give up on something to get the ultimate property in the right location at the right price so that's really important to find what you want down when you do that and you're crystal clear on it make sure your partner is as well so if you're in a relationship family um constantly we look at these things and someone will say um you know, oh, I want a three bed and I want to be in, you know, wherever. And the wife or the husband will say, oh, no, 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 no. Like we, we only need two beds. And, you know, I, I, it has to be right at the beach. Otherwise, you know, I'm definitely not going to buy something. So they're having an internal argument. It's like, okay, well, you're never going to find something because you haven't had that open conversation up front. So before <laughs> you do anything else, define exactly what those five non-negotiables are. Sounds very simple, but it can take people um, a little bit of time. The next so thing what we are need to the do. Five? So how, well, how would you define that? So location, price, house makeup, like three bed, two bath, what attributes. Type of asset it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. like yeah. House, townhouse, then, unit, whatever it is, and then right. um, yep. beds, baths, car parking, pool, land size, whatever's important to you for there. Um, anything that you, that's very specific, like you know, I said knockdown was part of mine. I said north to rear as part of yep. mine, so that was quite specific. Each of the escarpment um, as well was one of yours. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, and you could change that. Maybe, maybe um, I would have traded off a north facing rear garden, for example. So, I should have just deleted that and changed that. But yeah, so my example is just my example. Use whatever it is that that is going to be suitable to you. But the more you limit that, obviously, the more you're going to limit the deal flow. So, if you know very specifically where you're going to live and nothing's going to change that, then you can be very specific. If you need to be a bit more general, then be more general. But the problem is most people don't get very specific what they're looking for because they don't know yet. They're gonna they go through that process mm. of saying, Oh, I'd buy a three bed or I'd or I'd buy a four bed or a five bed. So okay, but what actually exists in your price range and what actually exists in terms of that asset type? Like I have clients will come to us and say, Well, I want to buy in the Gold Coast. I had this recently, and I want to buy a mid-century modern house and uh, and I want to be in these locations. I'm like, well. That doesn't really exist on the Gold Coast because there's just not a lot of old houses. Like there's not mid you know, century. Yeah, when did they build the first house on the Gold Coast? Probably nineteen sort of sixties or something. Maybe no, nah, before know. that. There's old sort of beach houses and stuff before oh, that. But in general, that doesn't really <laughs> exist. Like you're looking for a unicorn in a haystack, right? So yeah. starting off with that brief is just incredibly limiting to begin with. So you've got to understand yep. that you know where you're looking. Those types of properties um, exist, and we'll get to that in a second. So define your five absolute must-haves, and then. The next downfall for people is not getting laser focused on where they exist. So from my 30 years of doing this and doing it thousands of times with buyers and watching the mistakes that buyers make when I was an estate agent is that they can't pinpoint on a map where they want to buy. So they'll see a nice property in Surrey Hills that they'll love and they'll buy in Waterloo, you know, or they'll mm. see a property in Paddington and they'll buy in Darlinghurst. And you might think those two things are the same, but they're not. There's a variance in price. There's a big variance in lifestyle. Um, in traffic flow, in transport links. There's so many different things. So you're comparing apples and oranges. You're trying to find um, where the value pockets are, or where the spots are that you'd be happy living. And these are the problems that result in the 45% of Australians reporting to have buyer remorse. They're the people that say, okay, I'm looking in Surrey Hills, but then buy in a completely different location because they perceive that location to be better value than Surrey Hills because they can't find what they want there. So and they're is looking it similar, in the Is it similar for investors as well, Scott? Like uh, what sort yeah. of, what's the equivalent for, are uh, they just sort of don't, they're ill, ill-equipped to, because they're not sure of the location, which part of the suburb they actually want to buy in. So the agent doesn't yeah. know what to send them. Yeah, I'll talk to people and, and they'll say that. We're, I'm looking in Perth, Adelaide, Townsville, Ipswich, Toowoomba, Gladstone. How can Rockham, you do that? How can anybody um, yeah. keep track of that many markets? 
yes, it's it's impossible. And then you start trying to weigh up. Well, I saw a house in Perth that was selling for five hundred and fifty thousand as a guide price, and we both know that probably means nine hundred and seventy million that it sells for. And you, <laughs> and then and then they see a property in Rockhampton, and they say, well, this one this one's six hundred, and and you know they look very similar, and the rest of like, well, hang on, one's going to sell for a hundred thousand dollars more than that. Uh, it hasn't sold yet, and the other one, you know, maybe it sells for that kind of price, but they're completely different markets. They're completely different cash flow situations. Um, you know, there's a whole heap of different things to take into account. So I think with investors, um, you, you've still got to do the same thing. You, you're better off to get crystal clear on the reasons why you want to buy in a particular location, understand the asset type, understand the makeup of that property, and then get really laser focused down to ideally one to two suburbs. The best buyers by far that I dealt with over that long period can really clearly define it, which is why my example, I was incredibly specific about where it is within one suburb because it will change your life if you can if you can do that. So the trick is though, once you've done that, is to then go to, and the easiest thing I do when I'm talking to talking to clients, you can do it right now, go on to realestate.com, go into the sold section, go into the last 30 days, and then plug in your filters and tell me, does that exist? And what I'm trying to work out there is, first of all, are we fishing in the right ponds or are we wasting our time? Do we need to move the search? You know, do I, I look on the map often and I say, okay, well, it doesn't exist in Surrey Hills and Darlinghurst, but it does exist in Waterloo and Zetland, for example. Okay, so, you know, do you really want to be in Surrey Hills and Darlinghurst? Um, if so, do you need to change your filters? Do you need to increase your price? Or would you look at Waterloo and Zetland in that regard? So, you know, wherever we're talking in Australia, I'm just comparing these different suburbs that yeah. kind of ably. Yeah, so it we go make, through that. It makes a massive difference, right? If you go to someone and say, we want to buy 500000 in in Armadale, you might actually be in with a shop. But if you say, oh, I want to buy it in Joondalup, you're not going to, it's not going to happen. Um, no. And then you list out, I see it all the time where people like list out like you're saying, 100 suburbs and like, great, got anything around here? And then it's just too wide. It's too wide of a thing. So you're saying go as narrow as possible. One of the things you talk yep. about is $2 million price tag. Now, what does that actually mean? Do I just give the agent, boom, hey, Mr. Agent, I've got $2 million to spend. That is my absolute max, 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 max walk away. Um, uh, but does that not lead them to drag my price up? Like, how do you think about price by giving them a $2 million price tag? I read an article this morning, which probably a lot of people in this group read from a high profile nationwide buyers agent who ran an article about the four things not to do in property search. And one of the four was do not tell the agent your budget. And I think that is one of the greatest wow. furfies in Australian real estate. Yep. Yeah. As an agent, I gotta as an that. agent. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. like, we'll talk about it. Yeah, as an agent, I can't understand why the hell you would do that. Like, I need to know what exactly you're looking to spend so I can send yeah. you the right properties. Otherwise, I'm going to send you things that are below what you're looking to spend and you're not going to be happy <laughs> or above it. And it's a complete utter waste of time. So I'm a believer in the biggest thing you can do is um, start off with your North Star. So if two million bucks is your budget or 200 grand your budget, whatever, it doesn't matter. Have the very strict number there so you know exactly what you can go to so you don't waste your time and you get the right properties. The trick, and we've spoken about this on Facebook Lives before when I've spoken with you guys, is to switch in the very first conversation. The conversation goes from our budget is 200 grand to we've got 200 grand, maybe even 300 grand, but we don't see value at that level. We mm. see value at X and this is why. Bang, 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 bang. Instantly gets rid of the elephant in the room. I never, ever go back to talk about the budget again. No agent ever, ever repeats that. So it doesn't no, matter how don't. much money you've got. I, I laugh and I'll say that all the time with clients. Oh, we put 1.7 on there because that's what they really want to spend, but they actually can spend about two and a half million. They've got tons of cash. They just don't want to spend it on that house and this is why. Bang, bang, bang. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't make And the agents don't they? care. They do not care. It's just, it's a live negotiation. It starts now, go. They couldn't give a shit what you told them a week ago or a month ago. And they probably don't even remember because they, if they're speaking they to 200, like, 200 people, I mean, I, I, yeah, that's, that's an absolute sort of, yeah, I, I, it's like you're reading my mind. It's, it's important though, because that's a question I was going to ask you because a lot of people are going to say, well, I don't want to be transparent with the agent or I don't want to be because they're going to use it against me in negotiation. And if you're not transparent, you're not sort of at least open. How, how are they going to get that deal done? They're going to go and speak yep. to Mr. Mr. Don Smith or Mrs. Sally Sally Smith down the road, who's who's very clear and is articulate and is qualified, and he's going to get that deal done and move quickly. So go on, Scott. So, well, that's a good point. I think if you can't, if you don't understand how to change the conversation from budget to value, then you're already in deep poop before you open your mouth in a negotiation. So that is one of the first tips that you know you should write down to understand why that's important. 
and to make sure that you start a negotiation on the right foot and you're not because the agents will use it against you if you keep bringing it up or you tell them that's your budget or whatever they'll use it against you i'll give we're, we're getting off cuff here but i'll give you one quick um um reason why this is important if and we've done this before again but i'll do it really quickly here if you if i'm an agent and jeff makes me an offer and says i want to buy 12 smith street um, my budget's 500 grand. I'm going to give you all 500 grand because I really love the house and want to buy it. Okay, great. I'll take that to the owner. Joe gives me an offer. Mate, um, love the house. Really like it. Under offer down the road on another property. Um, this one's my preference. Want to go go for it. Um, you know, where I see value based on the property that I'm already under offer down the road is 500 grand. I want you to take that to the owner. And if, if they're not willing to take it, blah, 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 we'll jog on and buy another property. That is a, not the spiel I would use, but a tight version of it for 10 seconds. When the agent goes to present that offer to the owner, they're going to say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, Jeff's made an offer of 500000 It's his budget. They can't afford it anymore. And they really love your house and they'd love to buy it. Joe's made an offer on your property. They don't see value for these reasons, these reasons, reasons. And if you don't take it, they're going to buy that property down the road, which is better value than yours if it goes beyond $500,000. they are completely two different conversations. The first, yeah. the seller's going to say, thank you, Scott, for bringing me two offers. Please let Jeff know they sound like a lovely family. They don't have enough money to buy my house. That's how. That's what happens, right? Your budget is of no relevance. As soon as you tell everyone it's, that's your budget and you're going to that level, you're dead in the water because you know the owners are just going to turn around and say, well, they don't have enough money to buy my beautiful house. They have to take Joe's offer seriously in that case because he's explained to them the reasons why it's only worth X. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take that, he's going down the road. So it forces them to make a decision, right? It's a... Bad use of my words that I would have used in that situation, but it gives you the kind of rough version of, of why that's important yeah, in that instance. Absolutely. Uh, it makes perfect sense. Like, why would you why would you go there and say, oh, well, I can only afford X, then this thing is worth, well, I don't care. It's not, it's yep. none of your, none of the agent's business. It's none of the vendor's business. They they want the highest and best price for the value of the property. So I love that. It's, um, the same, it's the same thing with people making offers. I had a client today say to me, um, oh, the agent was, um, asking offers over 390 and i said okay great and, and um have you made an offer and they said yeah we've made an offer already i said okay yeah where was it they said oh 410 i said okay great so what's it worth oh uh yeah 410 because that's my budget and i'm like yeah well, that's got no relevance to the to, to what it's worth it could be worth 320 you've just paid ninety thousand dollars too much it's got no relevance whatsoever to market value and no one cares what your budget is like so you know just make the people just don't quite understand how the process works and if you expose yourself the agent will absolutely rip it to pieces and like take can, you can we go off the cuff again i want to understand how do you establish in probably 30 30 60 seconds how do you establish value or what you're what you see value at yeah, well, you've, you've got fundamental online tools. You've got the sold section, yeah. like this. <laughs> well, we're calling well, up agents as well. Way, yeah, yeah. The very the, the the short version of that, and we can send examples of this if anyone's interested in it with our market analysis. We use a one page document. We start with what they paid for it last, and the date of that, what the growth rates have been since then, what the rental estimate is, all of the due diligence on the property to understand anything that will influence the price, <laughs> all of the comparable mm -hmm. sales listings, all of the competing listings, and then we own a number. So in in top you know on top of that that the, the 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 buyer doesn't really need to go into the weeds with unless they ask is you know vendor discounting auction clearance rates um, days on market deal flow consumer settlement where's interest <laughs> rates all the rest of it like there's a whole heap of confidence stuff around those things that come into our you know numbers as well but at the at the well very basic answer well. question that's it. So we've got this off market. So when we've sort of we've been presented to it. We've got our five criteria really so strict. We've sort of been having great conversations with agents, getting sort of deals. Where do we go now? We've got well, let me dial it back now. just a tiny yeah. bit. So where we got to there is that we were going into realestate.com in the sold section and we dig through and yep. make sure that those properties exist. What we're trying to establish is um, to determine your fear of loss, how hard it is to replicate that asset and, you know, really what your patience level needs to be. And the key thing for me when I do this is to understand how hard it's going to um, be to negotiate that property in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whenever it turns up. So I can tell you straight up that if... Jeff says to me, I'm looking for a three bed in this suburb for 500 grand and there's only one of them in the last 30 days. I'm going to set Jeff up to say, okay, Jeff, well, it may take us 30 days to replicate that asset or that opportunity. When it does, you're going to have to jump on this really quickly because I can see what buyer depth is and auction clearance rates. And there's no point coming in with a shitty low offer or a dumb offer. You're going to have to come in with a really full offer closer to the, to the target price. 
to have a chance of getting this because if you miss this, it's going to take another month. And at the moment, the market's moving at 1.2% a month in that, in that price bracket within that suburb. So I can kind of set those expectations as soon as we start. Yeah, and then there's always, always a curveball. There might be two that come up in the next seven days. You never know. But at least you're prepared mentally to say, this is possibly going to take me 30 days. And when it does, I need to strike like a cobra. Boom! <laughs> Strike like a cobra. That was such really a great, like, oh. such a great tip uh, for <laughs> for anyone to, to actually consider. What is what is the is it common? Is it a normal thing? Does it actually show up? Um, because there is also the opportunity cost. Because if you can't get that next one or the next one, and you've been on the market for six months, that the markets. I mean, right now, Perth six months ago, South Australia six months ago, Queensland six months ago. Uh, were, I don't know, forty, fifty thousand dollars different. Yeah. Like well, six hundred six hundred thousand dollars at the moment in most suburbs of Perth that are hot, it's probably a ten thousand dollar cost to you if you miss it and it takes another month. Yep. Not cheap. Not cheap. Yep, not cheap. So once we've done that, so I'll keep going through this. So we est establish that and understand what the fear of loss is there and how hard it is to replicate it. And then the next step is really where we do a lot more than what I think any buyer does and what everyone should be doing at the bare minimum. So I go into those two suburbs of, of interest. Let's just mm. say, for example, I know we're stuck on Perth, but I'm just going to do this because I did this test at home before. Okay, mate, keep Jeff going. Jeff Perth is hot. Jeff Jeff keep talking about the hot things. Mm. How many agents do you think have sold a house or sold a property how many individual agents have sold a property or currently have a listing in Rockingham in Western Australia in the last 12 months? Just a guess. No right or wrong answer, except if you're wrong. I could probably get, well, that's, uh, maybe I reckon 15. Yeah, I'd yep. say 20. Yep. Okay. So there's 180 in Rockingham in one suburb. Okay. So this is really, it's a trick question. And I ask every single person every single day this because every single person, not every single person, most people answer 10 to 30. Okay, and it's almost always four times to 10 times more than the guess. Okay, so it's a huge range. The reason this is really important is because if you're not speaking to all of those people every week without fail until you buy, you are not going to create as many pre and off market opportunities as me. Yeah, and if I'm a buyer in your market that's competing against you, I'm going to get there before you do. So this is why this is a really simple thing, but it's just if it's done and executed well, it will make a significant difference to what you do. So go now, into those two. Or well, sorry, does that make sense? Go yeah, that it. makes sense. Yeah. One question I have. One question I have for around that is: there's 120 bot. There's a 120 agents that have purchased or sold a property. Uh, but it's kind of like the 80-20 rule, right? 20% of them are the real ones that consistently keep deal flow. How do you prioritize? Because I've only got so many hours in the day. How do I actually make sure that I'm spending my time on the good folk rather than the bad folk? How do you determine what's a good agent to, to Great buy? Great question. From? Great question. And it does, that doesn't come up very much, but it's that's a, a question from someone that kind of understands how the market moves, right? So there's going to be exactly that 80-20 rule. And the mistake that buyers make is that they deal with the 20% of people that are the busiest because that's who they see and is visual in front of them with the most listings on the market or they see it open for inspections. And they're the people that I just told you before are basically too busy. I'm dealing with 200 people running all my campaigns, cherry picking my own buyers from my own underbidding you know, properties. And I don't, I don't say I don't need you, but I don't need you as much as the agents that aren't in the top 20%, right? And this is where the gold lies. So that's a very good question to analyze because it's, it's exactly why this system works better. So when we get to a position where we know there's 180 agents in Rockingham, for example, and most people are looking in two suburbs as a minimum, so there's probably 250 people, let's just say, that you're going to talk to, we extract all 250 of their details. So for five and a half years, we've done that manually. It's time consuming, it takes hours, but you only have to do it once and then you can send the same list out every week. But if you, we actually <laughs> digitized this before Christmas, we've got a digital product where one touch of a button and we can extract all that agent information. But let's just call it 250 people. You wouldn't want to spam when an agent. That. Surely not. They would. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna, well, we get that, yeah, sorry. We get that list of 250 and we hit them with your BCC email with those five non-negotiables every single Tuesday mm. until you buy a property. Now, the reason is, sounds dumb, Tuesday, just trust me, we've had six years of research with this, that's the best opening rate, and we surveyed agents as to how they want to receive this, and they want to receive it on email. So there is no fluff that goes with this email. There is no, hey, my name's Jeff, I've got two boys, I love Bitcoin, um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really into weird shit after dark, um, and I want a blue kitchen <laughs> and a pink door. Like, they don't care, okay? That's that is brutal, it. 
brutal thing and they don't care so make it as simple as possible which is why you know i came up with the whole bullet point thing because it keeps people honest to just limit the amount of words that they're going to use so send that list every week without fail um we've found that that will start to snowball over time so there's lots of examples where we send it and within in an hour two hours of it going out for the first time a client will get a response and say okay i found a property that's seriously interested or i've been sent three or four that, that look like they're in the sweet spot for me it doesn't always happen like that you'll hear me say this all the time there's no hard sell on this there's no silver bullet sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but we play the law of you know percentages here and more often than not for our clients right across all price points right across any busy market anywhere in the country this works so even in perth even in toowoomba even in townsville right now where it's super competitive we still get pre and off market listings and it's about creating those opportunities and again resting at night knowing that you're doing everything you possibly can to unearth these properties so we start to get responses from that and it snowballs over time as you build rapport um to your so point are you calling so we had 100 and 250 emails out are you then because yep. that's one click of a button i mean it, manually doing it sucks yeah you got to do it but once you've got yep. the list you just keep rinse and repeat that's not very much work like are we calling all of these agents uh how do you determine who the hot ones are and who the not ones are to actually call and spend your time on the one that the tasks that do take yeah. your time so you'll see from the email responses and i suggest that you wait yeah. two weeks before right. you call anyone because you'll see from the responses who's actually taking this seriously or not in terms of giving you deal flow or, or responding right. to the email so i would start by talking to those people before you go through a list of of 250 people um, and you'll see as well that some of the agents haven't got a huge amount of listings um, but the goal again is in the people that have got the time to do this so the top 20 agents or top 20 percent don't have time to take this list because they've got their buyers and they're under bidders already some of the really good agents do some of them have got teams of staff that will go through and, and call us back and go through that process but it's often you know agent 31 and agent 77 that respond because they're sitting at their desk going i've got an open database at work um, i know where these people are they've clearly defined what they're looking for i know this exists and yeah. i'm not i haven't got a listing and i've got lots of time to to phone and this is a twenty thousand dollar commission check if i can just pick up the phone and, and get a listing for it so they're the ones that actually service mm -hmm. us with these listings more often than not so it doesn't always have to be the top agents it can be um, mm -hmm. some of the lower tier agents that do the work for you and, yeah, and I, I would say that that's kind of speaks to this. I think it's a good question to ask. You speak to a good or bad. I mean, to me, I want to sort of speak to an agent who's going to, I'm going to be able to buy a property at a competitive price based on what I want to pay for it. I mean, if I'm talking to an agent that's got sort of hundreds of listings and is very busy, they're likely going to get 15, 20 offers or whatever it is. So what are your thoughts on this, Scott? <laughs> I've given you my thoughts, but what do you reckon? Um, in terms of are you speaking to a good or bad agent in terms of this whole process, if that's the case, we talk to everybody and we do not leave one soldier behind. Like every single person is getting that email every single week. And today, for example, we had a complaint from an agent that, that said to us, um, you know, this is repetitive and it's, and it's boring. It's kind of annoying. And I was like, okay, cool. So on a Saturday, you're going to go and meet 200 people that are unqualified. You don't know who you're dealing with. You're going to follow all of them up. You'll spend all Monday and Tuesday calling all those people and chasing them. You have no idea who's legit or not. I'm giving you a qualified lead with a defined, you know, buyer brief that we know exists and you think that's boring or you're not interested in receiving it. So some agents are just like, put a gun to your head, stupid. They don't get it. It's like the smart ones or anyone that's got half a brain cell would go, okay, this is easy. Like this is shooting fish in a barrel. This exists. I can go find it. I've got a massive database. Let's do it. There's easy money. I like this. And that's what happens. You can actually use these genuine buyers as a reason to, you can actually go and get that listing because they're motivated. They want to get that Absolutely. commission check that they're, yeah. yeah. There you go. I've actually, What's more I've actually, than, I've chatted to agents question. and they've screenshotted a text message or an email or something that I've sent them saying, Hey, I just spoke with a vendor. I reckon I'll get the deal. Sent your screenshot to them. Are you ready to go? And the answer was, yeah, I gave you the brief. You know what you want. I know what I want. Let's go. Um, so you yep. secure it. I'll secure it. You've done, done your job and you've spent an hour of total of driving and chatting to that person. And now you've got a deal done. Congratulations. Um, totally. sometimes it can be that easy. It's not always though. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yep. So to answer this, the agents that want to respond will respond. The agents that don't want to respond, who gives a shit? Like, you know, they're not going to yeah. do it. So all, all you can do is put it out there and and um, drive your own, you know, life and uh, your own goals. And, and if you can get that done off market or pre-market, then fantastic. I like it. Yeah. Well done.
Yep, that's right. So that's that's really kind of at the the simplest of what we do. But there's other parts of this that I mentioned up front that are really important. So the two things that follow on from doing that is consistency, right? You have to send this every week and you have to do all the agents. Don't cut corners. So don't get bored at 130 and say, well, there's 120 left. I can't be asked. Do 250. If you can't do it, pay someone on the air tasker to do it for an hour or whatever and uh, or a VA or something like that that you use at Very work, true. whatever you can do to get that done. You can do it at a low cost that it doesn't have to take your time and you only need to do it once. And if you put the list together, you can probably sell it to another investor if you chuck it on Facebook or a group or, you know, Facebook Marketplace or something else and sell them the list Facebook or whatever. Put it on somebody back. else's it's, group, somebody else. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's ways of dealing else. with these things that you, you can get your money back. So anyway, once you've done that and once you've been consistent, you send that out every week, there's two more steps that are really important to make this work that we do consistently and really um, deliberately. One is if you are an agent and you call a buyer, you call Jeff and say, Jeff, I got your email with your buyer brief. I've got that property. I can get you through at 4 o'clock this afternoon. And if Jeff rings and says, mate, I'm getting my perm done, I've got my nails after that, and yeah. then I'm playing bowls, you're not a real buyer, right? They're not going to take you seriously. And that, Because if I read my hot buyers that just missed out on auction on Saturday or in a midweek negotiation, they make a beeline for that property at 4 o'clock. In fact, when I was an agent, the buyers would call me and say, Scott, don't show it at 4 o'clock. I'll be there at 3.30. Don't show anyone else through. Like we've already driven mm -hmm. past it. I've looked at the old photos of floor plan. This is it. Don't show anyone else through. They go into panic mode, right, in terms of getting there quicker than everyone else and trying to shut all channels down for other buyers. That is a real buyer. If you don't respond like that, you're a nobody, okay? And you're not going to get any other opportunity from those agents. It's going to be very rare. They will only deal with the qualified lead, so you've got to help yourself. So highly responsive. Now, you might not be able to get there. You might have the kids. You might be in a meeting, but at least communicate that and say, oh, my God, that is so kind of you. I really appreciate that. Um, I cannot possibly get there this afternoon. Is there any way, shape, or form I can get there at a different time that would suit you? Or can I send my grandma to go and look at it at 4 o'clock or whatever the hell you've got to do? But I'm just trying to point this and highlight it, that it's really important that you're incredibly responsive and that you stand out. Next thing you've got to do, and this is one of the big things that would annoy me when I, when I um, was selling, is that I'd go to great lengths to show Jeff and Joe through a property, and I'd never hear back from Jeff. But Joe would call me back and give me feedback in real time, okay? Jeff's not a yeah. buyer in that instance. No matter if he's a serious buyer or not, he's out. He's off my list because he doesn't communicate to me. So if he doesn't return my calls, doesn't respond to my emails, doesn't text me back when I want him to, and doesn't give me real-time feedback about why he didn't buy that property and what it is specifically that wasn't right to help me fine-tune that so I can get paid on another deal with him, Jeff's dead to me, right? Joe, on the other hand, is giving me feedback, and it might not be the right property. He might say, you ticked every box, Scott, but the road was too noisy or the third bedroom was just a bit tiny, a bit smaller. If you could just get me on a better, better location on a side street with a slightly bigger third bedroom, that's us all over and we're done. That's great because what it means is you're a real buyer. I take you seriously. And I now know that with a tweak in my mind of what you're looking for with my database when I'm talking to those owners, I can find you one and I'm going to get paid very quickly. So now Joe is absolutely on my radar, right, as a super hot buyer in that circumstance. So you've really got to be a high-level communicator, whether it's something you like to do or not. You just need to step up your game for the short amount of time that you're looking to buy and um, make sure you're in all these agents' pockets. And also, you know, I was one, so I can say this. Many agents are douchebags. I was probably one of them as well, BMW suit-wearing, slicked hair, dickhead. Um, now, whether you like them or not, whether you like the process or not, whether you think the game's rigged in their favour, whether you know that they work for sellers and not for you, whatever your excuse is in life to feel like you're the victim, they are the only gatekeeper. If you don't service them, if you don't work with them, you won't get what you want. So I think you have to yeah. sort of that view of the world's not against me. This is just how the game works. I'm going to navigate around these 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 um you know, BS strategies of the agents. And I'm going to actually take note and understand what they do when they do it because there's patterns here. There's absolutely yeah. how this works. Yeah. Right? And if you well, understand think, patterns, you can pick it apart. Yeah, I think this leads perfectly into what we were talking about um, in, in our kind of warm-up to this is talking about the scripts um, that people use, that, that, that you use to get some of these different... Um, get these amazing deals because there are different situations. There's situations like trying to buy the deal before auction. Um, there's situations like when when there's multiple offers. Um, I was chatting with a um, lovely person today and they said, um, Joe, what do they say? Uh, the agent said, I can't, um, I can't give you the price. 
Uh, I can't tell you what the price is. And the person's like, well, how the heck am I meant to know what the price is if they can't tell me the price? Um, yeah. Yeah, what's another scenario? Uh, multiple offers, bidding against myself, right? Hey, the agent, Mr. You know, the vendors come back and he says, your offer's not high enough. Oh, are there any other buyers? No, it's just the vendor. Um, so let's go that. through some of those. I mean, all of us, but some of us have. Oh, <laughs> actually, before well, we do that, well, let's let's chat to that. We'll get ready for let's, that. Let's do one of them. Which one do you want to do, Joe? And then we can. Well, come on. Let's talk about auction, on buying before auction. Let's talk yeah, about buying right. before auction because there's a property. Well, let me go. Okay, you roll. You roll hey, with so you. Tell me, your, tell me your, tell me your, tell me your your example, and then I'll unpack that. Situation is, um, there's an auction, twenty second of February, which is a couple of Saturdays away. It's an amazing property. I love it. It's the best fit. Perfect for me. Um, it's only just come online right now. Um, the, the the guide price is 800000 and um, I want to buy it. Um, I haven't visited okay. it yet, but I do want to buy it. Cool. Okay. So let's start with a few things that you have to do no matter how the property is being sold because I think this is a good sort of what's the foundation okay. that you should go everywhere before we hit this pre-auction spiel because I think it, they feed into each other. So you should never be looking for property unless you can accurately analyze the market value in real time. Okay, so that's the first thing that you need to understand the fundamentals of price and yeah. uh, what's happening in your local market and be a local area specialist before you start actively chasing properties to buy. So, and talking to agents and wasting their time. So accurate analysis skills is, is key to me that everyone has to have as a base. Second thing is, is there a mutation um, when people can know that they've done that or because how do you know when, when you've got that now? Well, even as a real estate agent for me, um, I, when I, I've spoken about this with you guys previously, I've gone back and researched how many properties i would looked at in the flesh, not online in the flesh. And I would typically look at about 50 open for inspections or private viewings before I bought every time yeah. I bought. And I'm up to probably yeah. 29 of buying and flipping, buying and flipping. Um, so I've done that a lot. And, and now it's getting easier and easier because I'm staying in one location and I don't have to look yeah. at as many properties. But I also understand the fundamentals of that marketplace. I'm at ninja level on realestate.com. Like I look at the thing about 15 times a day. You know, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous because I'm just obsessed with, you know, what's happening in the market and I love property. So unless you're going to be obsessed like that, um, either outsource it to someone that understands how to analyze property or learn the skills to do it. And I think if you had Muscle four memory, weeks... Them. Yeah, four weeks and four weeks of look at, so we're getting off track here, but this is a good question. So if you're going to understand how to analyze what's happening in your marketplace, if you're looking for a three bedroom house, I would look at every two bed and four bed house, as well as all the three beds to so understand where the value pocket is, because you might realize that you're better off buying a four bed for $20,000 more, you know, or it's the gap between the two bed and the three bed is just not worth it. You know, it's a $200,000 gap when you probably only need a two bed and it's going to cripple you in the mortgage if you get to a three. So yeah. I'd look at two and four bed. Either side of it is how I always did it to educate myself on where a market's at. Go to every open for inspection you can. Rule out your day. You know, when I buy, I would look at, say, 15 properties in a day when I go into a new location, right? So I just block out a day, hire a car, fly in, whatever it might be, and just hit everything that I possibly can to build rapport with agents, understand different value pockets and locations, how they all sit compared to transport, lifestyle, shops, everything else, um, and to, you know, really get a sense of what is available in the marketplace so I don't make a value decision without seeing enough properties. So if you've gone and seen, seen enough properties, you also should be tracking the auctions in real time. So I would be going to auctions, understanding real time buyer depth, how many people were there at the top end of the auction result. Because when you just look at realestate.com and say on Saturday night at six o'clock when the notification comes through that there was 72% clearance rate across Australia, that's not relevant to what happened in Surrey Hills today. Um, if I look in Surrey Hills and see what happened, you know, four out of seven properties might have sold. Um, and you can see the prices, but you can't formulate looking at a number, how many people were bidding, how competitive it was, and what's the strength of the market. You need to be there. When you're there, you might realize there was one goose who bought the property. No one else bid past 700,000. They went to 750, and then they bid against themselves and paid 820 when they didn't need to. Like, and that happens just constantly in every market across Australia, every single auction day. So you need to understand what's happening in the marketplace and what the buyer depth is. So I got a little bit off track there, but they're the, wow. they're the simple okay. things that I would do to be yeah. consistent. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm with you. And it, the becomes a six, it becomes a sixth sense. You you will know when you see three bed, two bath close to the water, 
great. I understand that price. Three bed, two bath. Whoa, that's a crazy price. I'm going to call the agent right now and have that conversation. Um, so you're yep. talking about the foundations and it may be that this rolls into that agent conversation, but what are the foundations yep. for any deal type, whether it be auction or, or um, yep. uh, open or no price? How do you come up with it? Yep. So the other little trick, the throwaway trick that I would do in that situation is um, when you go through to the open home, mark what the agent tells you as a guide price and then track what it sells for. So you can see how much, um, how full of shit those agents are, like in terms of you know how much underquoting they're yeah. doing. So you, if you come up against them, you can expect roughly what games you're going to come up against and understand yeah. where people are pushing those prices to based on, on, on those guides initially. So you can kind of rule stuff in or rule stuff out if you think it's going to be a waste of time. Now, the next thing that I would say to you that is another key thing that um, buyers make a mistake on is using desktop valuation tools to determine value. So yeah. we've discussed this a lot. Um, I just, it's Here another one of those kind of bullet to the head things for me of people that are obsessed with using them. And I, no matter how much evidence I show them, they just cannot get it through their head that I'm not as smart as ANZ and their desktop, you know, valuation tools. So I'm wrong and ANZ is 100%. right or whoever the tool is that you what, want to use. Um, what do you so feel the, the inaccuracies with that tool? Like I, I've got a, an, an understanding myself, but what do you what do you reckon are the big in, inaccuracies that people should be aware of? For those um, well, in certain locations, you might have thirty to ninety days lag time between the actual you know actual signing of a contract and then when it settles. So the data might be yeah. out fair while in a moving market. Um, I find that they can't price in major renovations or you know even new builds on a block of land. Like there's so many variables like that that's just completely yeah. missed. The issue yeah, that yeah. I have when I look at the property, so I've just gone and done my own properties. Like, what are the three last properties that I owned that I bought, and, and what's the estimate say now compared to like what I even sold them for? That's public knowledge, and they still fuck it up and can't get it right. Um, is things like. Um, you know, they, so we talked about the renovation is one thing, but then the guide price is so wide. So I had one property that I paid two million dollars for, and the range that was quoted was one point five to two million. So how can you possibly make a decision on what to pay when a desktop valuation gives you a 20 25 percent range? Like it's just impossible, right? It's useless. And then so many of them are just out by hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of what they're actually worth. And yeah. this is just a common theme that I've seen from, from you know, years and years ago as a real estate agent of people who just turn up and say, my broker gave me this, so therefore I'm not paying any more than that. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Well, come and see me in two or three weeks' time when you're still looking because I'm just about to sell it for about $70,000 more to that person just there. Yeah. yeah. Like you're, you're not even competitive. And, and it, the more you turn up with these things, the more you're going to almost get laughed at by real estate agents. So they just, yeah, you need to smarten your game there and actually learn how to accurately anal analyze property, which was my first point. Okay, so we've gotten to analyze. Let's let's start chatting to some of the conversations uh, around um, getting these deals and chatting to the agents and the words that we need to be saying and the things that we should be avoiding to be able to do that. But before we do that, let's jump into this uh, little thing. Got to delete that one. <laughs> I keep running the wrong ad. <laughs> As a Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special announcement from the master of commercial property investing, Steve Polisi. I love commercial property. Get ready to have your minds blown as Steve is back and he's got some pretty exciting news for us. Steve is unleashing his second sensational book upon the world. And get this, for the Oz Property Investors members out there, he's giving it away absolutely free. Mm -hmm. Yep, 100% free. Yep. 100% free for all property enthusiasts who want to learn and grow on their commercial property investing journey. But he's also added a little extra chili to make this deal even spicier. With this free book, you'll also receive a complimentary one hour strategy session with the man himself. Imagine a full 60 minutes with Steve's commercial and property genius dedicated to helping you master the intricate dance of commercial property investing. And who better to dance with the man who looks better than Patrick Swayze in Dirty Dancing? I don't know about that. Want to grab this offer? It's super easy. If you're live right now, click the link in the comments and secure it today. If not, grab your device, open up the browser, head over to policyproperty.com, look for the book page and grab your free copy of Steve's latest masterpiece. And when you're checking out, make sure to use the exclusive code OZPROP to secure the free book and also your free one hour strategy session. My only concern with this offer is that Steve's going to have to turn it off soon as he can only do so many sessions. So if you want to secure your spot, do so today. Oh, nearly passed out there. 
<laughs> good one. I just I saw in the comment section that am I allowed to swear? Sorry if I offended anyone. I'm very sorry. I'll try and keep them in. Oh, gee, we just got cancelled on YouTube. Passionate. Oh, jeez. And uh, yeah, exactly. That's right. Like it, when normally it, it just sort of is flying by. So we're, we're talking about the the tactics and the the conversations you have, regardless. Of the are we still talking auction, Joe? We're going to go to uh, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Let's pre auction offer. If you want. Pre-auction yeah, pre offer. We got an auction. It, we want to. We want to buy one. it beforehand. How do we? How do we establish this situation? How do we get the best deal? How do we get it beforehand? Yep. yep. Okay. Cool. So it's going to start for me with a pre-call power call. That doesn't make any sense. Pre-call is what we do. I don't power know call. Pre-call. Power call. So I will ring the agent, and you'll see me do this a lot, and we've, we just kind of role play this sort of stuff all the time. But it just it, it I don't use it all the time, but it works so efficiently that it does get used a lot in, in my world. Um, I will ring the agent, and I will go through that whole spiel. Um, actually, let me start this again. I'll start it again to make this clearer. If Jeff rings an agent that is selling the property that Joey just mentioned, that offers over eight hundred thousand, it's an auction campaign that's coming up. Jeff's likely going to hear this script. Jeff, thanks for the call. Yep, great listing at Smith Street. We've had heaps of interest. We've only just put it online a couple of hours ago. Um, expecting a great turnout on Saturday. Really looking forward to seeing you there. You should definitely get along. The vendor's really motivated to meet the market. Um, they're committed to sell. They're keen to get it moved on. Um, this is going to be a great opportunity. I look forward to seeing you at 11 o'clock on Saturday. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. What they've just done to you just then is create competition, reverse the fear of loss, make you a sheep. You join the queue. You're going to do it on my terms. And they've just bullshitted, bullshitted, and bullshit. Oh, sorry, I'm swearing again. Um, and they're going to do that to every single buyer. So the conversation is very differently when I, when we call or I call. I will say, um, g'day. Uh, it's Scott here from, uh, I don't even say Hello House, but Scott here looking for a property for my client, um, Jeff. Now, Jeff's been looking for a couple of months. Um, in fact, we're actually under offer for Jeff down the road. We've been looking at this property for a, cu for a couple of weeks now, and we've found something off market. Um, the agent is putting the blowtorch on us, though, and it's Tuesday today. They said to us, if we don't exchange unconditionally by Thursday, they're going to put it on the open market, and we obviously don't want that to happen. Jeff's been looking for a while, as I mentioned. Um, Smith Street's just come on. I know it's not open until 11 o'clock on, um, on Saturday, but this looks like their preference. Um, it's in their right part preferred part of the location um, within the suburb it looks in really good condition based on your floor plan and, and uh, photos they've been past it and had a look at it already in the car um, made it looks good now the only problem i've got is this time pressure from this other agent um, is there a chance that i can get in and see this early and where do i need to position to jeff to buy it yeah very different conversation now all of a sudden the vast majority of times not always but the vast majority of times i get responses like uh, look, mate, we've already we've already knocked back eight hundred and thirty thousand. Vendors counted at nine hundred. If you're at nine hundred, they'd sell it today. If it's somewhere between eight thirty and nine hundred, you know, come along and have a look at it. Okay, great. Well, yeah, that's in the price range for Jeff. So, can I get Jeff through at five o'clock tonight? Uh, because we won't be here on Saturday. So, you know, we we we've got that money that's within our sweet spot. We can definitely act at that level. Um, in fact, Jeff's got a million bucks. He could spend more than that if it's the right property. So, I'm trying to bait them into letting me in the door because they think they're going to hit pay dirt. Someone's going to overpay. Right. I get you in the door, ideally, before anyone else has seen it. And then, of course, when I go back to the second call, you've seen the property. I'll say, yep, g'day, Scott again. Yeah, thanks very much for showing Jeff through. Really appreciate doing that. Now, as you know, I mentioned to you in that call on Tuesday, um, we have to act by close of business this afternoon. Otherwise, we're going to miss that property. So don't, you know, it's not me. It's the other agent, unfortunately, that's putting us under that pressure. But we need to act. We need to act quickly. So I'm going to make you one offer. Okay, I'm going to make that unconditional today really clear of all um, bad negative terms. It's going to be exactly what your seller wants in terms of settlement, deposit size. You know, we'll take the dining table that they want to leave behind, blah, 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 blah. Um, we've reviewed the contract. We're ready to go. And I'm just going to make you an offer um, that I believe is, is you know, fair market value for the property. And it's probably even overpaying for a little bit because this is their preferred location. But if you don't, if your owners don't accept that, we totally understand and respect that. They've only just gone on the market. We're going to go down the road and buy that other property so we won't be here. Now, that offer is $865,000. i would love you to put it to your owner and come back and let me know what they think. You know, we're ready to do something this afternoon. In fact, we could sign in the next hour. Yep. So I'm... I'm changing that entire scenario. So everyone else is waiting to see it for 11 o'clock on Saturday. And now you're in a negotiation one-on-one -on -one with the seller. And that seller has to make a decision. Well, Jeff's not going to be here on Saturday. So either I engage Jeff and exhaust him or I say no and we just run the chance that we can get 
get more for it. So some will say no, obviously, it's a numbers game. Some will say yes, and they'll accept your 865, and some will counter at 900,000, which is where they counted the other buyer that offered 830. And now at least we know that we can buy it at 900,000, and we're $35,000 apart, and what happens next is a negotiation, right? And we just move quickly and fast and close that in as little steps as possible. So the pre-call... <laughs> is crucial because it sets up everything I do thereafter. It reverses the fear of loss. It puts the vendor under time pressure. It puts them under direct pressure if you deliver that, you know, time of the essence wording politely. I used language or power words that drive those actions that I want. So I talk about this property is our preference, okay? Don't, anytime an agent gets a call and says, Oh, mate, yeah, I'm looking at 14 Smith Street or 12 Smith Street and I'm going to make an offer on both of them and fuck, whoever, whoever accepts it, I'll just get that. I'll take that one. The amount of people that have told me that over the years, it's like, mate, yeah. go and make up your mind which one you want and then when you're dead serious, come and sign an unconditional contract. Otherwise, jet off, you know, like jog on. <laughs> um, and and yeah. that's really kind of what you've got to say to them. That's my preference. We're here to buy it. We're ready to do the deal today. And I'll often say to them, um, if, if I make an offer at this level, would you support that? And by that I mean... Are you going to take this to your client and educate them that that's where the market sits and encourage them to seriously consider that offer? Because if you don't ask that question and you go in all guns blazing saying, mate, it's only worth 850, you know, get stuffed, I can buy down the road, this is a rip off, you're dreaming. They're not going to put it forward to their client and say, this is a great offer, you should accept it. They're not going to do that. Mm. So, I, you know, and, you, and you're never going to know. You're going to make an offer and then you're going to have to start bidding against yourself or join the queue on Saturday with everybody else. So I always ask, at what level will you support it? Well, mate, I won't support 830 because we've rejected that already. They want 900. I don't know if it's worth 900. Look, if you give me something over 870, um, I'll definitely put it forward and, and, and you know, it's going to be a serious conversation and it's going to be their decision whether or not they want to sell it today. That's a better outcome, right, than just trying to dictate terms. So words like and then do you believe support. Yeah. And then do you believe that? Like do you believe when he says, look, it's got to be eight, it's got to be 870, it's got to be 870, is that is that just what it is like is does it have to be how do i get the price down because because where i see value is actually at 860 but do you say yeah look at 870 it's kind of it kind of makes sense and then you then you go and do the inspection and you identify problems that reduce that price like do we how do we get the the best price well, rather than yeah i mean money? it's all a negotiation yeah, it's all the negotiation and understanding what levers to pull when, and it's based a lot on asking the right questions and listening really intently about where they, you know, how the agent um, mm. spins that to you in terms of where he thinks it needs to be positioned. But support is such a good word because it's like support. you're basically saying to them, um, what do you think I need to do to buy this? <laughs> and some of the agents are just like in, in Queensland, in Western Australia, in lots of different parts of the country, and lots of really, really good agents as well. And I'm talking the absolute top of the tree in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and other places that I've, I've bought from gun agents that have got massive profiles in the country. They just want to do deals. They're volume agents, right? So I asked this question. I bought a property. Um, I won't tell you where, and I won't tell you who the agent is because it's just going to open up a um, can of worms. Um, but I bought a property off um, what I perceive as one of the top agents in terms of their profile in the country. So incredibly famous agent, right? This was two weeks ago in Sydney. And they were quoting a price well under $2 million. And the most recent sale was north of $2.4 million in November, which they did. So they were hor horribly under quoting. The only difference between the two properties is one had two car parking and one had one. Okay, so the very first thing I did was text this agent and say, I've got an interest in this property, what buys it? Okay, and he instantly wrote back and said, 2-2 two, two plus. So I got rid of all the fluff of 1.8 plus and I got to 2-2 two, two plus in, in 10 seconds, right? So it's just asking that yep. one simple question, what buys it, right? So I get that answer. And of course, they're not going to tell everyone that. Um, this is, you know, because I've been in the game for longer, maybe is, is where there'll be, in, and others like me that, have, that, that possibly have that advantage and some of these relationships long-term with these people as well. But then when we got into the negotiation and we can, we'll dial back, we'll come back around to this because I want to talk about this negotiation if we get time as well, because I want to unpack um, patterns in negotiation, how people can pick these things, because this played out in this negotiation a couple of weeks ago. But when you do this, um, I got into the negotiation with him and I got to that point where we were at um, the 2.2 mark. And I said to him, exactly that, where will you, um, where do I need to be positioned here that you're going to support this? price that I put forward. And my client wants to know 
that if they put any more money on the table, it's going to be because your seller has come back to us and told us exactly what number they'll take. This is pre-auction, first week on the market, okay, in a booming Sydney suburb in the, yeah, I, I won't go into detail. So, so that, that, and the answer to that was I got a screen grab straight away back within 15 minutes from the owner who was overseas in Europe. And it said, if you get me 2.25 million tonight, I'm done. Right? <laughs> I had 2.45. I saved two hundred thousand dollars by asking that question. Yep, I did it all on text message in, in less. What do you mean you had minutes. two point? The client gave me two point four five million as a target price based on our analysis of the property, and we bought it for two hundred thousand dollars less than that with one of the best agents in the country. Yep. So it, it, it's all it's, over it's text. A, so this is not a word. Over text. This is not no. a word thing. This is not a script thing. Well, this is except except for what buys it, which is my always my go to line. And then yep. I asked, what, you support. know, what will you support? Okay. And then I said mm. to them, and I reversed the fear of loss. And I said, well, not reverse fear of loss, but in that in, in, in instance, I made it. I turned it around and said, we will pay more money, but only if your client clarifies exactly the price I'll accept tonight with no further negotiation. And that price was fifty thousand dollars more than where we were. We paid it and done. Yeah. Yep, unconditionally right. changed nine o'clock at night, whatever it was, and <laughs> job done. Yeah, easy peasy so, lemon squeezy. Yeah, so but that, it's, it's that, about that understanding those script. questions and realizing <laughs> that agents agents just want to get deals done, right? Like, like if you the right agent can be on your side if you just get cut to the mm. cut to the point and you ask the right things and you know you control that process. There's a skill and an art form to that. That's right. So we've, we've, we've talked about um, auctions. We've sort of talked about, we've touched on sort of multiple vent, multiple vendors. I think we've talked on all sorts of scenarios. Is there anything we haven't unpacked in terms of scenarios? Well, one of the things I have is um, information gathering during that initial call. So we're talking about that initial call that you jumped in and, and you kind of jumped into a role play pretty quickly into about, you know, your situation and everything, but you didn't gather the information um sure. about the property what yep. what information do you because a lot can be done online already beforehand um how do you gather that information and try and keep it relevant um in in a negotiation yep so a couple kind of things that i would use yeah. yeah a couple of things that i would use in that situation and i just did this tonight on another deal in sydney in elizabeth bay was to call the agent and say is your so it goes to auction um again i won't go into the details because i don't want to blow up my live deals that are in play with anyone listening or knows of these people hopefully there's a few um, deals going on in Elizabeth bay at the moment but yeah oh hopefully. yeah i hope so I hope so. I just, I so there's nothing to, there's nothing to hide here anyway but um i always ask um is your vendor ready to sell Okay, because if you're going to go headlong into making an offer and then they turn around and say to you, well, mate, it's a divorce. It's got to go to auction. Like it's absolutely going to yeah. auction. It's a trust sale. It's a deceased mm, estate. Yeah. You know, you've just put your best cards on the table and I'm just going to use that against you now for the next three and a half weeks. But there's no point. Yeah. So is your vendor ready to sell? And a lot of the times the agents will say to me, mate, they're not. Like, I want to get yeah. this thing sold just like you do, but they're not ready. Like, the wife hates yeah. the husband. The husband wants $2 million. The wife will take $1.8 this afternoon. Um, like, mm -hmm. like, honestly, if you give me an offer now, it's just going to screw up the whole thing. Just let me run Saturday. Let me do the vendor meeting Monday night and then give me that offer. They'll, they'll actually lead me to the finish line. Yep. And, and, and because they want to get deals done, right? They want to get things done. So if you ask those questions, you'll get the right answers and you've got to be a good listener and ask them at the right time. So is your vendor ready to sell? And then I'll always ask, what's the best offer you've rejected to date? Now that pins them down, right? It's not, have you had any offers? Who cares if they've had 100 or one? It doesn't make any difference. How many contracts you've got out? Who cares? It's irrelevant because people just collect them like, you know, stickers. Um, it's like, what's the best offer you've rejected to date? Now, if the if the agent stalls and then has to come up with a solution to that answer, you can bet they're lying, right? Yeah. And a, a good agent will just say to you, 1-8, we're not back. They're not selling at 1-8. It needs to be better than that, you know, or something like that. They know what the best offer is, right? And they'll tell you if they're confident that they can control the negotiation. So ask, what is the best offer you've rejected to date? How do you Makes know sense? when they're lying on, on that situation? Like... Um, because people stall and if they have to, like, it's just a thing that you learn over time. And hopefully most people know this in terms of dealing with people and having relationships. But if someone has to sort of stop and think of an answer, they're lying. I think in most instances, not, you can never be hundred percent sure, but just, you know, reading this over, you know, a whole career of doing this, you get a really good sense of who's telling the truth and who's, who's fibbing. Um, and then often I find when people are lying, they give you the most elaborate backstory and 
if you <laughs> ask an agent, um, have you got our other buyers on this? A good agent will just say, yep, two or something, or yep, there's three other people and you actually are in a contract race and this will probably be sold by tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, yep. a bad agent or a, la a lazy agent or someone that's lying will say, yeah, well, there's, there's a guy in Hong Kong and um, he's got a contract and he's really interested and he's going to fly in on Friday. And then we've got a buyer's agent and there's a Chinese guy. And like they just they tell you the whole story and you're like, mate, like, okay, I, you, you lost me at Hong Kong anyway in the first place. Like, I know you're just full of BS. So you, you get a sense of this. You do it often enough. You, you get a really good read on people and um, the game playing that goes on. So, yeah. That, yeah. How do you respond yeah. when they won't give you what offer they've rejected? Like, how do you respond to that? You just kind of. Let it, let it slide or you ask a different way? Um, I'll ask a different way, but at that first pre-auction call, I probably don't push it because there's no point until I've got rapport with the agent and I'm further into it because they're not going to give you that information unless you start to show serious intent to buy the property. So I would circumnavigate back to that later and say they've seen it, um, you know, what have you rejected? Where do we need to sit? Where do I you know, have to position Jeff to buy it? Um, what will secure yeah. it? You know all those different questions and i'll just keep asking those things until they give me some sort of door in and then i'll smash that door down yeah. if we can and, and try it but it's it's as, as with everything i say with you guys there's there's no single thing that works every time right it's a numbers game yeah. so it's not yeah. about shooting one bullet and 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 getting the result it's sometimes you know you shoot six and, and you get blanks and you, you've got to go reload and come at it from a different angle like there's just there's no guarantee it's going to work that's why you've got to have a big kit to dive into to, to ask for so, this. so that's why it's so, a learned skill yeah 100 percent. It, it's practiced as well um you're so confident someone mentioned yeah you're so confident you've got it down you got it down pat but it takes time to develop that um what happens when the agent says i can't give you a price it says like price not disclosed or best offers or how do you kind of dig that price out of that out of that agent to to kind of know where it, where it's all sitting um, sometimes you never do, and that's why accurate analysis was the very first thing I told you that starts with every single property. So all you can do is fall back on what you're prepared to pay for it based on the comparable sales evidence and be confident that you know, you, you've got in and got out at a level that you're happy with and walk away if you're not successful. So that's going to happen a lot in situations like Queensland, for example, where they can't quote price on EOIs and auctions. Um, but I find, and possibly I saw one of those um, comments before in the, in the group chat, um, that they may tell me as a sort of professional, but they won't tell the buyers. And I think that is very much why you should outsource these things to a professional because there is just a distinct unfair advantage in a lot of these instances. I don't know why. It's stupid that we can get the information out of them, but they won't tell you, but that is often the, the situation that unfolds. Um, so it's just off, like it comes, it comes down to volume as well. Like if you build a relationship with one buyer, that is one transaction that's going to happen. Whereas I'm buying... When I'm having a conversation with people, it's like, great, we do X amount of volume every single month. Um, we are going to buy with you consistently. So let's just get to the point and let's get a great price for you. So I guess like it's just goes back to what you were saying. Agents want to get deals done. Um, yeah, just but I would, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. What you said just then is absolutely correct. But I would also say that we buy nationwide and I don't deal with the same agents all the time and we still get the same mm -hmm. outcomes like, you know, when you kind of measure oh. it across the board. So I think if you do those things, you'll still probably end up with the same, you know, kind of good good outcome. But in terms of the point that you just said, then in terms of will they give you those numbers, it, a lot of the agents, if you keep badgering them and you ask different questions and you're relentless, yeah. you'll get an answer out of them. Even though legally they're not allowed to tell you, even though they shouldn't tell you, often they still do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just it is. It's honestly, it's, it's it, it really is. I, I completely agree with you asking in, in in a couple of different ways because, and, and then it's just more about that consistency and about so that tenacity. If you if you <laughs> if you're able to do that, then they'll sort of say, okay, this person is actually serious. They're not just going to give up at the first go, and that's what they're going to yep. be like. They're actually going to follow through with their offer. They're Real serious buying this property. Real buyer. Yep. Now, there's a couple of extra things I'll get through quickly because I know you guys are going to be short of time. The other question I always ask is, Never how will you ex? Hey, thank you. How will you execute this process to close the deal? Right. So many times I read in your group chat or whatever. Oh, I made an offer and they sold it to someone else for less money, or I sold it to someone else and they didn't come back to me, or, or, I didn't or it sat there for a week. I put an offer and it's yeah. been accepted. Yeah. That, that means I yeah. probably sold it to somebody else. I'd say. Correct. So, how yeah. will you execute this process to close the deal? Simple question. What are you going to do, Mr. and Mrs. Agent? How are you going to run this process? 
what, how, how is this going to, what's this going to look like? Because I don't want to be just left hang, hung out to dry. I don't want to not hear from you for a week. So put, put the onus on them to give you an answer. And most agents will tell you, well, the process is going to be, I'm going to take your offer, present it to the owner. If they're willing to accept it, I'm going to go back to my database, ring every buyer that I've got, see if anyone else can beat it. If they can't, I'll sell it to you. Yeah, like, yeah. and I'm going to yeah. do that in 24 hours if the owner's well, Yeah, and then it. I'm going to keep going back and forth with you, um, bidding you. So how do we make sure yeah. that the agent um, agents like educated buyers who ask good questions? So yeah, that's a good point. Um, so um, one of the things was bidding against yourself with the vendor. So you like that you've got your offer out there, you're at 800,000. Um, then the agent goes back and says to the vendor, hey, Mr. Vendor, We've got Scott here at 800,000. No, no, no. And, and I don't know if this actually happens. It might just be the agent full of full of BS because what I imagine happens is the agent goes there. We've got this really good guy at 800. I reckon I can get him to 820. You want to give it a shot? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Sorry, sorry, Joe. Sorry, Scott. Um, we, we can't get you that. I know you've got a great offer at 800, um, but it's going to have to be a little bit more. Like we need to really push this. They're aiming for 850. I've talked them down. We can't get across the line at 800. What do we do? What do we say to that? So, so that kind of goes back to the example that I used at buying it at two point two five the other day and saying, at, at what price is your is your vendor ready to sell? And at what price um, are they basically willing to sell it now? So, another additional question might be, if I make you an offer of X, is your client ready to accept that today with no further negotiations or game playing? Like, close them, close them mm -hmm. on it, right? Like, I'm going to make if I make you this offer. Are you going to come back and play these stupid games or are you going to accept it? Because if you're going to make the stupid games... Because if you games, are, I'll go I'm and buy gonna, 40 down, yeah. down the road. Yeah. Like, I'm out. I'm out. I will, I've been burnt before by agents. I'm not going to play that game. I'm looking for a relationship where there's trust. If I make you an offer of X, which is what you're telling me you'll support, I want to know that your client's ready to accept that today. So if that means if you can go and call your owner and say, if I get this client 830000 will you accept it? And you come back to me, I'll give you 830000 Yep. Yeah. But if you don't, there's, I'm, I'm not going to, and some agents will say, mate, get stuff, like put your offer in and, and whatever happens, happens. Like, you know, I'll, I'll be the boss of how this process plays out, but at least you've asked. Like, and, and in most instances, it works for me when we ask that. It doesn't work all the time again, but it, you know, these are the things that you've got to try multiple different things to, to try and get the best possible outcome you can. Heaps of questions. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. great. Um, so, okay. Are there any other scenarios that, that we haven't hit? Bidding against yourself, Bidding against other people is pretty like when there's other offers from other people. How do you actually get that? Actually, a great question. How do you get the price out of the agent about that that deal? So there's, hey Joe, just letting you know, there's four buyers um, on the go right now. You are you're not the highest offer. Um, yep. So you need to we need to we need to work it a little bit more. Um, how do we how do we make sure that we're on top um, but don't overspend? Well, that happens so much in this market. Um, so that's going to happen to tons of people if they're looking at buying in any sort of rising market conditions. The thing that we do is try and build rapport. So if it's like an expressions of interest or EOI when you know, or a multi-offer situation in that, situ in, that in that situation that you just explained then, um, we want to build rapport really quickly with the agent. So we want to try and get on, you know, buddy-buddy terms as best as I possibly can because I want to extract as much information to benefit my, to, you know, my, my um, negotiation strategy. So um, one of the throwaway lines that I try to use is to say, um, okay, how many buyers am I competing against? What's the real number? Just so I can establish the, you know, the, the competition. And I'll say, yep, there's four people coming in this afternoon by three o'clock. Okay, good. Um, what's the highest offer you've rejected? Well, we haven't. This is it's best and final offers. Okay. How are you going to run the process? Are you going to go back to these people after they make the offer and then do round two? Is it going to be ping pong back and forth? How are you going to run this process and when is it going to close? Um, yep, it's going to do this. This is the process. Okay, great. Is your vendor in a position that they're going to accept the highest offer that's made today? Yes, they're 100% selling based on where we're at now um, and they're, they're going to sell this afternoon. Okay, all right. Now, I'm going to ask you a favour and this is because we we know that to buy this property, we're going to make the highest offer by virtue of the fact we're going to have to win this, we're going to have to make the highest offer. We're not scared of being the highest offer. We see value in this property and we really like it. So what I'm going to ask of you is, and this is going to help you help the seller and help me, whatever the highest offer you get, I want last right of refusal to beat it. If I can beat it, I'll pay more. If I can't, I'm out. You win. I win. The seller wins. Yep. Shut up. How do you feel about that? <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> so not that doesn't always happen. Some of the clients will some of the agents will say to me, "Not nah, get staffed. It's a fair process. Everyone's gonna you know have a crack at it." I go back. And to, I go I'll back to everybody. Keep... You give them one one final crack at the yep. cherry. And, you put, yeah, and you I'll put keep going at them in that situation. I'll say, okay, yeah. great. Well, look, just give me any any hint you can. Like, obviously, we want to be the highest bidders to win this. What do I need to do to buy it? What price do you think is where the seller's at that they'd be ecstatic with the sale today? Look, you know, they told me before that if they got eight fifty, um, you know, they're out, done. But look, I don't know where the other three buyers are, so you've got to make your own judgment based on that. But I know that if it was at eight fifty, they'd sell <laughs> on a heartbeat today. At least any data point you can get is a win. Any bit of information like that you can get. And you've got to be able to read through a lot of the bluff as well. Like some of the agents are deliberately price positioning you at a certain level to say, well, you know, oh, well, if they got 850, that's what they told me they'd take, but they'd probably take 830. You know what I mean? Like you've got to understand where the value of the property is, where you're prepared yeah. to walk away, what your target price is, um, and then work out whether you think the agent is trying to bluff you or not. But normally in those yeah. circumstances, if it's a case of a multi-offer situation and they give you a number, it's typically pretty legit. Like, you know, the yeah. owner wants 850. Who knows where it's going to go with the four people that are in it, but, you know, knock yourself yeah. out. So I just, and I, you know, I get desperate and just say, you know, exactly what I said before. Like, I'd really love the final shot. Um, you get paid more money. The owner gets more money. They're happier and we win. I'm happy. So exactly what, what Joe said timing? before. I'm in this game. I'm going to give you the management back potentially. I'm going to do lots of transactions with you over time. Um, it'll be a nice, clean, easy process uh, to get this across the finish line. Um, give it to us. Yeah. And what about timing? Um, because one of the things is, Okay, the, the process is you submit your offer and then I'm going to come back to everyone that submitted their offer and get their best and final. So you, do you then go in with a low that's sub, you know substantial? Let's say we want it for 850. We believe it's going to go for 850. You go in with an 820 just to get your hat in the ring, show you committed, um, and then do you come back and wait to the kind of last minute so he has all the information because right now he hasn't got those three offers in yet. He's waiting for yep. them too. He doesn't actually know the answer. So the answer is... Honestly, mate, I don't know what the price is because I haven't got any offers. Um, yep. How do you, how do you think about timing to get the, the 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 best number? I guess. Well, it all falls back on those initial questions, right? Like, how are you going to run the process and what it's going to look like? So, if you know that that's the case, that they're going to ask for initial offers and then do stage two, there is no yeah. point kind of asking that until you understand, you know, that they're in a position to actually sell it now. Those whole yeah. round two things is just ridiculously stupid. Like I always say to the, I try to talk the agents out strong. of it. Really yeah, I try to talk to the agent and say, why would you bother doing this shit? Like, just ask everyone for their best and final offer. Like, why ask for one and then go back and workshop it and try and get everyone to do it again? Like, ask, tell everybody, we are 100% selling it at 3 o'clock this afternoon. If you don't have an offer and it's sold, it has to be over 850000 Otherwise, you're not even going to be included in the process. And you're going to get one shot and you're out. Make your own life easy. Like, why are you doing double the work yeah, exactly. or triple the work? It makes no sense. They get and that's when you bloody... get the best offer. But they get, but they, the crazy thing is they get it because people throw in lower offers and then they get that stressed out call. Hey, mate, just letting you know you're not the final offer. Throw in. No. Like we're having a chat with Nikki Derike, who's a leading agent in WA. She's like, yeah, we had one guy come in. I don't, I'm going to bluff the numbers, but it was like 480. And the other guy was at 520. I did the callbacks. This guy went up to like 590, 560. Yeah, yeah, and the other guy went up didn't go up at all because he was at his best and finals. But anyway, it's it's just aging games. But if you, but if you put a line in the right? sand and told people exactly Where'd what the go? rules of engagement are, yeah. you'd get the same number out of them. Yep. If, if, if you said you are going to lose this property unless you put your absolute maximum walk away line in the sand, you are not going to get a second chance. Typically, that's when you get people paying those massive overs because they're like, I don't want to miss this and I don't know what to do and I'm going to overpay. So it still all falls back on know what your number is, understand how to analyze a property, and you only go to a level where you're happy. Beyond that, you've got no regrets. So if you play that game that you know we've talked about before of you know, even when you're setting your auction reserve price or you're setting your auction max bid price or your EOI max max spend price, you look at it and go, okay, I'm prepared to go to 800, and then your partner might say, well, I'd go to 810. Okay, well, 810 is our target price, but would you lose it at 815 or would you go to 815? Oh, we'd go to 815. Well, 815 is your target price. What if the agent came back to you and said 821 buys up right now? What would you do? Oh, we'd go to 821, but we don't want to. 821 is your target price. You play that game and you understand where your drop dead price is. No regrets. Never, ever does someone turn around to me and say, Scott, you know, I went to 821. We played that game and it sold for 823. Yeah. 
and I really regret it. It's like 821, we were busted. That was borrowing money off mum and dad. That was absolute, you know, bank of death for 30 years. For us, thank God we didn't, if someone else paid more than that, because we really didn't want to pay that price. That's typically what the answer is. So you just have to be honest. Walk away price, right? Walk away Um, target price. Love this. Scott, you have been so generous with your time, so thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll talk about the uh, the, the 20 giveaways because we've still got bloody 80 people watching live. Um, so I do want to acknowledge the people that have taken the time to throw in some comments. Um, so let's start answering some of these things um, and then we can chat to that. Um, but actually, this is probably... Let's load this one up now. It's a big one and, and I don't think we needed to cover all of it. But at the moment, I'm, my son's trying to buy a principal place of residence. The market's hot. No one is taking the time to take the calls or to have a chat. Um, they're asking for all these crazy things. Um, the feedback is the offer's just declined and there's no options to come back for negotiation. There's 20 offers. Like, how do we... Sounds like Perth. Is this still possible? Yeah, let, let us know in the comments what state that is and where. Um, is, this, is this what we're talking about now still possible in these hot markets or how do we reframe and think about these hotter markets where the agent does have 20 offers and they have no, no you know, thing for you? Um, how does it kind of, how do you think about it? Well, I think this session was perfect for this to start where we started. You build a strategy to find these things pre and off market, reduce your buyer competition, increase your deal flow and work with motivated sellers that are actually in a, in a, on a mission to sell quickly. Like that's the ultimate. So, you know, need to work harder into finding what you're looking for and finding those opportunities. If you're doing exactly what I coached you to do before, and I don't know who you are, and I, but I dare say you're not doing that because I don't know anyone else that in the public that does it, that, you know, that goes to that level of effort and you're that consistent and you still can't find anything pre or off market, I think the only thing you can be disappointed is is that there's just not a lot of deal flow and everything's selling fast. You can't be disappointed with how the agent played the game and didn't give you a second opportunity because you should have known that. That's exactly what we've just spoken. You should have understood how is this process going to work, asked all those questions I said, and then understood you know what you've got to do from there in terms of your best and final and if you know what the property is worth then there's no regrets you can only put your best offer in and if the market's hotter than and you're missing out consistently then i would say to you it's probably time to look at a slightly different version of where you're going to live like you know that's if you price consistently out of a market then you can't live in that market it's moved too much and it. there's not moved too much realistic. tell your son to watch this episode right from the beginning and uh yeah. He might be able to buy his next property. <laughs> and it's hard. It's really hard. And I, I respect yeah, what you're going through because that's a challenge for a lot of people in Australia. So it's a really difficult thing. But it's the definition of insanity to keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. So if you're in a market that's moved, there's no point, you know, shopping in that same same spot. Time to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's jump to some of these others. Um, yeah. I want to know, how do you compete with cash buyers? What are your thoughts on that? numbers game as well like get to these things as early as possible so you don't have to compete against a whole heap of them they're everywhere and in fact that is probably the single biggest trend i've seen in the last two or three years is just the sheer volume of cash buyers that we deal with day in and day out um so you know the only real way to beat them is to put more money on the table to to make a more compelling offer for them um you don't want to do that because you want to negotiate at the best possible price so you've got to get to these properties earlier and sometimes unfortunately it's very difficult to compete with if you've got a 21 day finance clause in queensland and someone's cash well then they're probably going to take cash cash buy even at less money or potentially at less money Um, i've got a bit of a theory that that maybe some people are just taking the risk that they're not actually cash buyers but they're they're going on unconditional contract and they need finance which if people are actually doing it, that's that's hugely risky. Um, but it's just a theory. I don't know. For sure. It is. It is to a certain degree. But we've again, this is another thing that we've discussed on this show previously over the last couple of years. Is you know, do you really need a twenty-one day finance clause when you've got conditional approval? You're buying a three-bedroom Seven house in an area fine. where there's five hundred comparable sales in the last three weeks. It's not going to get down. It's high chance that that um, it's going to value up as per that. If you speak to your broker and you've got a decent deposit, you can always change lenders if there's a, you know an issue with a valuation that comes in low. We had one the other day. We we paid seven hundred thousand for it. The valuation came back at six hundred and thirty five thousand. We're like, what? We have, like that happens to us like once every four years or three years. You know, and hundreds and hundreds yeah. of transactions a year. I'm like, how, how did that happen? And then they just yeah. changed banks, got it revalued, valued at contract price, job done. But yeah, I was you know what I mean? To like, I was Change chatting window. to an agent this, this week and she's like, hey, just letting you know that this this 
person, the, the bank has booked this valuer who just valued another property of mine $50,000 less. So just pre be, be prepared that that's gonna, that valuation is going to come in at lower. Um, yeah, it wasn't the case. But it's like fifty thousand dollar difference because they had to re redo everything. But when you say cash buyer, does that mean a um, hundred percent? You're getting a briefcase full of cash, or does it no. just mean no finance? No clause? finance clause. No finance cash. Clause. Unconditional cash is that the same cash? thing as unconditional. Yep. Auction yep. conditions. Yep. Yep. Auction same. Same. So I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you're waving your cooling off, and you you're just yep. buying the property yep. unconditionally. So yep. uh, yeah, I think you know, I I wouldn't sort of openly advise people go and do that unless they really know what they're doing and and yeah, exactly. you know, they're, yep. they're safe if, if, if you're confident as long as like if you're borrow if you can borrow nine hundred thousand and you're paying nine hundred five thousand that is probably quite risky because you're sort of not unless you've got a rich uncle or auntie who can sort of yep. if the valuation or if, if there's any risk of something happening I'll, um, I'll go just one just one thing to build on top of that quickly so You'll you'll deal with the cash buyer situation, you know, front on definitely if you're out there buying. Um, well, in yeah. most markets, but what's probably more likely to happen in a negotiation is that you're going to end up in a multi-offer situation where everyone has exactly the same terms. Okay, so mm -hmm. this this happens to us all the time. Like I've got five offers, like Joe said before, all of them have got 14 day building and pest and 21 day finance or whatever. Whenever you're buying in certain states in certain locations, almost everyone is just drilled into buying in the same way. So when I sold in Sydney, I never sold anything conditionally. If you came to me and said, I need a subject to sale clause or a finance clause for five days, I would politely tell you to jog on. Yep, it, it, you, it just didn't happen. Everything was sold with a 66W certificate and unconditional. That's just the way we did business. I would just say politely, Joe, that's lovely that you need a five day cooling off. Go and do whatever reasons that you need to do over the next five days to convince yourself you want to buy this property and come back and buy this property with a 66W. Otherwise, I'll sell it to someone else. Yep. That's the only words we used every time. And it worked an absolute treat because people were trained to buy property that way. You go to Queensland. So let's say you're in Byron Bay. People are trained that way. You go 45 minutes across the border to Queensland. Everyone wants a 21-day finance clause. It's like, why? You're borrowing I mean, off the same bank. You're both borrowing off CBA. Why do you need 21 days and they don't need any days? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, people are just trained the way they do. So what you're going to come up against if you're buying in certain locations is everyone's going to offer the same thing. So the way to put less money on the table and still win is to shortcut things with offers, right? So how do you streamline your offer and make it more appealing? You ask lots of questions to the owner about what they want, what's the right settlement, deposit size, what yeah. do they need left behind or take with them? So you streamline your offer, you dress it up really beautifully by just asking questions. The second thing is, if everyone wants 14 days and 21 days, for example, you can do it in five days of building a pest. And you might, if you speak to your broker, they can probably get the pre-approval um, or the paperwork done in nine days or 10 days, like depending on the, which lender you use. Ask those questions and break the cycle. Like don't be yeah. another sheep. Break don't the cycle 14, and all of a sudden they get five offers that are the same and then yours just looks like gold. Like, well, you know, the other thing that we used to always do is um, people would see a property that would come on the market. It might be Monday or Tuesday and a property would come up. Absolutely the property that's your dream. You've driven past it. You looked at the photos you've seen in the building before. You know you want to be in that building or in that street and it ticks all the boxes. I would say to my client, go order the strata search now or go order the building and pest now and get it done before the first open for inspection. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? That's so stupid. I'm like, well, this looks exactly like 99 out of 100 for what you're looking for. I would imagine that you're going to go through there on Saturday at 11 o'clock and 11.01, you're going to ring me and say, I want to buy it. And then guess what? I have to book a building and pest, which is going to take five days or four days. And so does everybody else. And then all of a sudden they're in week two. They won't sell it before the second Saturday. And then all of a sudden they'll say, we're less than two weeks away from the auction. So we'll just let it run. So I get the building and pest or the strata inspection done up front, turn up on Saturday at 11.01. I've already had the contract reviewed. And then I say, there's my offer, bang, unconditionally, you've got two hours to accept it. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to go and buy another property. So, you just how do you how do you shortcut things like to to you know without having to spend more money? How can you get yourself in a position where you can out negotiate other people? So it's it's just about trimming the fat and just being about a little bit smarter in this process. And the out from the crowd, out. I suppose, because in, in a market crowd. of hundred buyers, like how are you differentiating yourself from those other ninety nine? Here yeah, that's kind of kind of answered this question here, where does price versus terms? But the biggest thing for me is just asking the question: What is the vendor? What what are they looking for? What are they looking to do? Um, because I hear it all the time. I'm going to give you a 30 day settlement term, and 
no, no. The, the tenants, the vendor still lives there. They they don't they don't want to, they're older, they're elderly, they want 60 days. And then all of a sudden you've given a 30 day term and the agent's like, well, do you want that? You you must want that. Okay, cool. I'm not going to ask any questions, but you really should have had a 60 day or a 90 day or a rent back. Um, so yeah, asking those questions up front of what's the vendor looking for? What kind of terms are going to best suit them? Terms for me, I'm absolutely fine with. We're going cash unconditional and we're um, settlement what is best for the vendor? What would be the ideal situation? And most of the time, it's as quick as possible. But the other is 60, 90, 120, a rent back, whatever. Um, that's It's understanding yeah. those levers to pull, isn't it? I bought one off market last week in Brisbane and the owner said to me outright, it was a private sale from an, from an owner directly that wasn't on the market. And I said to her, what's important to you? And she goes, well, I can't, I don't want to go on the market because I'm just scared. I've been here for 33 years. I'm a single mom. I'm scared. I'm not going to be able to find anything. The market's just crazy. And I said, okay, great. Well, you know, what you really want is a clean sale, right? Like you want to know that you sold it, that you don't have to, you know, there's no sort of s stressful nights. And she's like, oh my God, I absolutely, if I could get a certain price and it was just nice and easy. And I said, okay, great. What's that price? And she said, um, it's X. And I said, okay, great. And we'd already run analysis and that was $50,000 less than what we were prepared to pay for it. I was like, okay, good. We can, yeah, we can make that happen. And I said, and what terms would suit you best? He said, well, you know, I don't know, like maybe like a longer settlement. And I said, well, what about a shorter settlement and a rent back? Like, so then you've got the money, the buying power, that'll give you control. confidence to go shopping because the money's in the bank, you're in control. Oh my God, I hadn't even thought about that. Is that possible? I'm like, absolutely. We can do a rent back. This is an investor that's buying it. Won't bother them at all. We'll do a three month lease at market rent. Um, we'll give you, you know, you can leave at any time with a with a month's notice without any penalty. Um, let's just make it easy for you. And she's like, that's just made my life so simple. I was like, great, let's just get a deal done and get a deal done, right? So you're like, uh, knowing what levers to pull like that and just simplifying the process um, is better than exactly what Joey said, walking in and people used to do this to me as an agent all the time. Mate, 845,000, 60 days or get stuffed. And so, like, well, that's great, but we want no. 30 days. So, no. What do you and you, and you have to accept the op yeah it, you have to accept the offer by five pm tonight otherwise I'm I'm yeah. I'm out yeah like I'm done okay cool no worries well you're out because I've already sold it to the person that gave us the deals that we wanted anyway which is the terms wow. that and they offer the same price I love so, how we yeah. mention stuff and yeah, how good is that yeah rent it's back. funny wow rent back is the best tip Pretty of the secret, night I love though. it. What other golden nuggets have people picked up? Because um, rent back for me, it was a similar situation when I first heard about rent back. It's like, what? This can this can happen. Um, love it. Well done. Well played. Um, there's another couple of questions in here. If anyone has any burning ones, throw them in. Um, I love Scott's thoughts. If offer accepted, process of signing and took too long for my from my end, but agent told me I missed the call and he texts me saying, I'm sorry, the vendor has gone with another offer and it's cash. I ended up getting it for the Price the other offer. offer. So the higher oh. offer, the cash offer. Hmm. If oh, offer accepted, okay. process of signing. <laughs> don't know why you start that one, Jacob. I don't know what the hell yeah. it's saying. I don't <laughs> kind of understand the question. Sorry, I'm trying to. I don't so, so basically, what this, they got this out is Jenny. So, yeah, yeah, they were just like it happened. They didn't know what the process was, and it sounds like you didn't know what the process was. Sorry, the vendor went with another offer, and it's cash um you didn't no no so what happened was jenny ended up buying the property but she paid the other price so she wants to know if that was a bluff or not and the answer to that question is we don't know because we didn't we weren't in that conversation with the agent so yeah, she still bought the property but she paid more so yeah i don't know so i mean that's a line that i would have potentially used against you as a as a buyer as an agent like in terms of price positioning against you absolutely so i'd be worried about that as a buyer generally that an agent will say things like i would say things as an agent to you like um uh you know we're quoting over 800 um i've got a really interested party that's talking 880 i don't have an offer yet but um they're indicating that they're going to come in on thursday with 880,000, and i just leave it at that right and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have to come in over 880000 to beat that other offer. Meantime, I've got no one or the best offer I've got is 840000 or, or whatever it might have been. So there's a whole heap of price positioning that goes on the whole time. Now, that you could say is lying. It's not like it's absolutely a lie, but it's not saying you've got an offer. It's saying you've got someone that's indicating they'll pay that level and they're going to come back to us by a certain date. So you're not saying I'm holding an offer, but people – insinuate or people would take from that that there's an interested party at that level and they need to beat that so it's all just in the positioning of that and how you word it dodgy yeah. as shit which is why i got out of that game it's just you can't lie yeah. straight in bed but, but it does it just <laughs> happens non-stop all day yeah yeah and, and, and it's and just, it just probably overcome down to them. 
Yeah. So here's a good question. Head. What are your tips for winning at auction if you haven't managed to negotiate prior? Have the deepest pockets and your hand up last. <laughs> yeah. No, the the only way to to win at auction is it's completely out of your control. You don't know how many people are going to compete against you. You don't know how much money they've got. You don't know what the vendor is willing to sell at. Um, so it is a game for mugs, unfortunately, bidding at auction. Um, how do you win at auction um, without overspending is probably kind of the way to do it is um, I always position ourselves that if it's within our price parameters and our budget, I get into first position as quickly as possible. I bid yeah. really quickly um, with speed. So anyone that counter bids me, I bid odd, like weird numbers, not stupid numbers like dickheads on TV, like 888-171-222, kind of in five cents. But if someone's bidding 800, 820, 840, 860, I'll say 900 like that because it breaks the momentum up. And someone says 920, I'll say 950 because it's bigger than 20 grand, right? It's 30 grand. So I'm always going at the, you know, a different number to break it up like that. And it's always further than the previous group of numbers. So if it's 20, I offer 30. If it was, everyone's going up in 25s, I might offer 40 you know, when I go up. So it's just those little psychological things that kind of say that I'm going to keep bidding here and I'm going to keep bidding really quickly before they've even finished the number I bid over the top of them straight away. Um, and it yeah. never works if they've got more money and they want to spend more money than you, you'll never win. Um, but yeah. all you're trying to do is that run them down that if they are on the edge of going, oh, it's at 900, I'm not sure if I should go to 920 because this dickhead's just going to go to 950 straight away and they don't and you buy it for 901. Yep, and yeah. instead of having to kind of get pushed another 20 grand or, or 25 grand potentially. But always and, get into the first of, position. Yeah, blowing them say, out. And then, and then don't out against the yourself if you can avoid it. Yeah, because yeah, you, you don't want to have a lot of emotional bidding quickly so you just want to knock out all of those first home buyers with mum and dad right there that that know they're crush not going to be able souls. to afford it crush their souls quickly oh. because mum and dad will get a bit of an ego and then they will with start the emotionally oh. bidding cobra swiping <laughs> cobra boom <laughs> need, need to crush their little souls yeah no i'm just joking but not really yeah just joking. All right, two more questions for maybe one. Would you pick, you pick one of them, Joe, or we can do both? What, what do you reckon? And, um, have I answered everything else that you wanted to in terms of what we talked about before the show? Have you got kind of what you wanted okay. out of? Uh, yes. I, reckon, I reckon Scott should do a post on that. I reckon, what do you reckon, Joe? Yeah, just in bullet points, what are, the steps, what are the steps you take before making making the offer? Um, I guess it's analysing and knowing the yeah, price, we kind of ran right? through all of those. I'd go back and listen to kind of what we just ran through because it's not really a bullet point thing. There's there's lots of questions. There's really all the setup stuff. There's all the analysis and confidence around what it's worth, the pre-negotiation call, and then the delivery of it, setting that call up. And and yeah, there's a lot of lot of steps. I think rather than I can do it a bullet point one if you want after this, but I think go back and listen to this a few times and, and really understand the nuts and bolts. Right, because it's quite write it up, Scott, I reckon, and I'll tag this person in. I'll actually remember that. If you write it up, I'll, t I'll remember to tag this person and we'll do that. Okay. We'll make it happen. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, I was five actually going to hour, do it for you tomorrow. Don't know. I'm um, 500 bucks an hour, Jeff. I said I'll do it for you tomorrow. Just let me know when you pay me. <laughs> text in the mail. Jesus. <laughs> <You're wanna just laughs> so is yours, so yours with mine, Scotty. You get $5 in five cent pieces. Yeah. Can I, yeah, can I um, just, can I, can I say this is a perfect time to it for those questions? Go do the course. There's 20 of them going to be given away for free. I'd love you oh, to yeah, go let's... do the course. I've spent 30 years amassing all this information and I've de I've derived it in, out of 44 lessons, easy adult learning, three and a half hours in Teachable. Um, you don't have to spend $1,000 to buy the course. There's 20 of those I'm giving away for free. So do what the boys um, do in terms of the link to that. Go grab that course because all of it is written there. You can watch it um, in video format in addition to that if you don't want to read. Um, and there's lots of workbooks and things that you can follow through. So that will be really good tips as well as, you know, any other questions, shoot them to me anytime at my email address and I'll always answer them for you. Okay. So how do people so, win this sucker? Because um, how do they do it? How do we get there? So just the first 20. So hurry up and first jump 20. on that link, I guess. Is that so go, go to the link. Sorry, I thought I jumped the gun. So talk us through it, Scott. How do they, they just need to jump on that link and, and the first 20? Yeah, go to that link, fill out the details there. Now. We'll, Look at him. we'll send you the, the free already, access to it now. Well, yep. I've already got the course. I actually, every Train. everybody that joins my business um, goes through this course just so they can fully understand the process and how it all works because it's so valuable. Um, and there's tricks and tips that we use every single day when we're negotiating on property. Um, uh, cool. Want, okay. This one because this this person last question I promise unless okay. Scott wants to more because this person asked the question twice. So he was persistent and he was he was 
So I want uh, Scott. I have a whole street I want to buy, and none of them are for sale in twenty years. That's insane. Must be very owner occupied. How do I get one of them to sell? What what sort of tactics would you have for that? Get agents on board, um, or would you? Yep, I'd have all you know X amount of agents that sell in that location with the same buyer brief of trying to get you into one of those homes because I just like leverage everyone else's time and database that I'd be doing that I'd be um, letterbox dropping I'd be door knocking if you had to I would be talking about um, how flexible your terms are so if someone wants to sell now but wants to lease it back for a number of years or whatever you possibly can if you if you can offer those flexible terms do that um, mm -hmm. but sometimes with these things like you know do you really want to be in a street if you're going to have to massively overpay because if you're going to have to weed people so this is a, a massive misconception about off market people will think that it's about door knocking or it's about going to kind of weed people out of houses if you do that you end up typically paying massive overs to get someone you know off their sofa and out of the house pre and off market typically is finding people that really want to sell so it might be um for lack of a better reason a relationship breakdown financial pressure they're bored already and they need to sell those types of reasons, it might be a rental property that they can't sell because it's messy tenants or is a long lease and it's in an owner occupier location. So there's a whole heap of reasons why people are always going to sell pre and off market. This one, though, in terms of trying to weed or fish people out, is possibly going to cost money to do it. And, th and that's where possibly if you want to be in one of those streets that you're going to have to pay overs and make it a really compelling reason why someone should get off their sofa and move out. Yeah. And I, I found that you know, we've done that a lot over the years for people when they're incredibly wealthy. Like some people will walk in when I was an agent and say, it's worth three million, um, I'll pay four because I, I want that penthouse or I want that spot. And, you know, if you've got money to do it and you really want to be in it, then, you know, money talks. Yeah, yeah. Yep, there's yeah, ways of getting people out of houses, but yeah, you're going to have to kind of buy them out in some ways unless you unless you get... You use that strategy as the first instance and try and um, find a, a, a weak link, really, or an opportunity. And I definitely advise you to do that because it costs nothing. Yeah, yeah. Any little, any little tip and trick. Go there, have a chat with them. So Let everyone's them saying the link is weird. Um, if you can't, I just for whatever I just reason. Read it. Okay. Okay, we're going try straight, to the, see, try, see that straight to the get by already course. Done. See hey, this has been an unreal true. session. Every time we chat that to works. you, you always have some new valuable insights to um, to share. And I really like the script side of things. I'm actually going to um, uh, get this put into a transcript um, and I don't and I don't know, chat GPT it to, to kind of bullet point it. Um, so Could you send it to I'll, me, please, show too? I want yeah, to Yeah, maybe I'll post. Uh, I'm just worried that GPT won't be able to pull out all the points very well. So I'm kind of concerned that... And it's it's easier to blow it up. I'm going to promise to that I'm not going to be able to give you too much. I'm going to have to type it up yeah. myself. Um, and don't be but, don't uh, be having me on the internet with words like you know crush their little souls or whatever because that's a bit rude. <laughs> how many times? Did Somebody's going to come back to it in ten years. <laughs> Scotty Agate, hello house. How can people learn more about you? How do people get this stuff? Like, I mean, look. To be honest, I'm a busy professional. I've got a full time job. I don't have time for this. I'd love to. I'd love to sit around, chat to agents all day, having fun, building relationships, getting off-market deals and doing all that fun stuff. But if I don't have the time for it, how do I get an expert like yourself uh, to help me? Yeah. Well, we are expert analysts and negotiators and we have a low fixed fee if you're interested in working together. And you can reach me at my email address, which is on the Hello House website. So Hello House, and it's spelt the German way, H-A-U-S, as per what's on the screen, .co. Um, yeah, I'm always happy. I've always said this for the whole time you guys have been doing this as, as the sponsor of the show with Polisi as well. Love um, adding tons of value if we can and, and you know, dumping lots of data from 30 years of doing this on the job. Um, anytime anyone wants to ring me, email me, please do. I'll always give you my time as I best possibly can as a busy person and see if I can help you in a situation. Even if you don't engage us, I'm happy to kind of give you some advice to see if I can, um, you know, solve a problem for you if need be on the run. Love it. Polizzi, um, Polizzi was lying to us. He said he was going to bed, but he said great session, so he's still on. That's good uh, Good plaudits from Polizzi. Nice. Uh, Link's work. Thanks, but he's, been talk he's been talking to me today on uh, on Messenger as well, so he's just buttering Thanks. me up because he wants me to do him a favour in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's end it on that note. Thank you very much, Scott Agat of Hello House. Let's go buy a property. Thank See you, you guys much, later. Bye, team. Thank Always you for great. having me. Arrivederci. Ciao.